instead of focusing on when Mashiach comes, we have to be more focused on preparing for whenever the Mashiach comes, we're already prepared right there and then. Because the opportunity we have right now is to do tshuva before Mashiach comes. Because once Mashiach comes, it's not going to be the same opportunity as we have right now. And that's why it says, and we say it in our prayers throughout the week, that the Goel, the Mashiach, will come to bring salvation to those that used to be pushim, used to be spiritual criminals, used to waste seed, used to walk around not modest, used to be stingy, used to have a lot of time wasted instead of learning Torah. So when people do tshuva, they become part of the people that will get the salvation the Mashiach will bring to the world. We're back here on our Wednesday night, Stump the Rabbi series, where uh, after some divrei Torah, you guys, Bezat Hashem, will ask some questions, and Bezat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. Tonight's shiur is going to be for... Uh, the Ilui Nishmat of Perel Silva Bat Osher Yitz. Uh, Hashem, uh, her, uh, Baruch Hu will elevate her Neshama for all of the good deeds that her dear daughter and sons are uh, doing in her behalf and will continue Be'ezot Hashem to do, uh, whether it's uh, sponsoring the Shiu or it's a uh, sponsoring the Limut Torah uh, on her behalf. Uh, certainly the uh, chesed uh, that's unlike any other that you can do for someone that's passed away is to do mitzvot on their behalf, such as uh, helping people do tshuva by sponsoring the shiu and uh, helping people learn Torah Bezat Hashem and our kolel. Uh, anyone uh, that um, wants more details, we'll get into that in a second, but first and foremost, of course, we have to uh, remind everyone that these shiurim are also for the atzlacha raba, refuash lema, for Rabbi Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana bat Sarah, uh, Sarah bat Levana, Avi Mori David ben Nesriya, Ini Morati Doris bat Jora, and all of Am Israel and all the righteous Noahides that continue to learn Torah with us, continue to contribute uh, and uh, help us do all the wonderful things that we're doing, Baruch Hashem. Uh, anyone that wants to sponsor these uh, weekly shiurim can go on our website, be'ezrathashem.org. Uh, right on the front page is a donate button with multiple options, and one of them is to sponsor the shiurim. Uh, for those of you that have asked me to come to your communities uh, to come uh, <coughs> set something up, as I've said many times, it's uh, hard for me to travel, but I'm willing to do it, but only if people arrange uh, large uh, events. Uh, so you could contact us if you could set something up. Uh, if not, we could just simply continue doing what we're doing now, which uh, Baruch Hashem is helping tens of thousands of people anyway. Uh, also, for those of you that have yet to fulfill the mitzvot of Purim uh, and uh, have uh, want a place to do it that you know it's going to go to the right place, go to bhpurim.org, bhpurim.org. Uh, that's our website where uh, you could do the mitzvah of machasita shekel for each member of the family, including if the wife is pregnant for the uh, uh, upcoming baby Bezod Hashem. Uh, also, the mitzvah of matanot le'ev yonim, to help the poor. Uh, this is more important than mishloach uh, manot or even the machasita shekel, even though they both go to the same destination. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are not familiar with all the things that we do during Purim to help the poor, uh, we combine Torah and Chesed at the same time, and uh, this year we're doing something that's bigger than what we even did last year, Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, which we'll discuss uh, tonight as well, but uh, we're going to have, Be'ezrat Hashem, 500 Avrechim uh, learn Torah on Purim, uh, and also 500 kids, the Yeshiva of Mordechai. The Yeshiva of Mordechai was kids learning Torah, and that's really the big thing that uh, canceled the evil decree of Haman, uh, so we're going to have 500 Avrechim, you know, Torah scholars, and also 500 kids studying Torah on Purim for a few hours, and each one of them is going to get a, uh, you know, money to uh, to help them with the holiday, to help them, uh, you know, uh, during this uh, time of the year. Baruch Hashem, it's a, uh, not only helping uh, them, but it's also helping all of Am Yisrael, uh, have more Torah in the world, more Torah in the world, Baruch Hashem. 
So this is going to be a huge event. We usually get some recordings from it like we did last year and the years before. So if you want to be part of, uh, uh, you know, a uh, Torah slash Chesed uh, and helping the poor all at the same time, go to bhpurim.org. And you could do it over there. I know that there are many organizations that are raising money at this time, uh, but I don't really know of anyone that's doing uh, what we've done and what we're doing. So uh, for any of you that uh, still haven't fulfilled that mitzvah, highly recommend going there. So with that being said, we of course have a, uh, a new book that we are starting, which is Sefer Vayikra in the Torah. Uh, we also have Purim upon us, uh, which is a, a unique holiday, uh, you know, that uh, actually really starts uh, tomorrow morning because we have the fast of Estel. Uh, tomorrow starting, uh, you know, a different, you know, pretty much at sunrise or a little bit before sunrise, just check your local times to make sure that you know when the fast starts. It begins in the morning and ends at uh, sundown or Tzeta Kochavim. But the exact times you should look up uh, based on your uh, zip code and your location of when the fast is. The fast is a relatively easy fast uh, where uh, you don't eat and you don't drink, but uh, you're able to drive, you're able to uh, uh, you know, conduct your businesses, whatever it is, it's just in essence fasting. Of course, uh, the, the point of all of the fast is to elevate our, uh, our, uh, ourselves to get closer to Hashem and study Torah, but again, not everyone is able to study Torah and just take off a day of work, so you're allowed to work tomorrow. Um, as far as a, uh, uh, the Megillah, on the other hand, the Megillah, we're actually uh, going to be reading it on Motzei Shabbat. Uh, in the, uh, anyone that's in the uh, exile and uh, anyone that's in Yerushalayim uh, is going to be reading it uh, on uh, Sunday. So we have Motzei Shabbat, and uh, for anyone that's in America, in England, in Australia, Canada, uh, most of Israel... Uh, is uh, any place that doesn't have a uh, choma, a, a, a wall that was covering it at the time of Yeshua Benun, uh, which we'll discuss tonight, Be'ez HaShem, why this is even the case. Uh, all of those places read the Megillah on the 14th of Adar, uh, which is on Motzei Shabbat, uh, and also again in the morning. Uh, then you have a, uh, the, um, the walled cities, uh, like Yerushalayim, uh, have to uh, read the Megillah on Sunday uh, and also Monday morning. So in essence, the, uh, uh, there's a very big uh, uh, discussion about it, why this is the case, and many people don't realize uh, the significance of all of this. Uh, and what does it have to do with uh, Yeshua Benun? Why, why is Yeshua Benun even connected to Megillah Testel. Yeshua Benun preceded the Megillah by over a thousand years. Uh, so it's not, he wasn't alive at the time of the Purim story. Uh, so why is, uh, why is this even connected to him? Uh, even more so, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Parashat Vaikra. Parashat Vaikra starts the Sefer Vaikra, and it is perhaps the most difficult part of the Torah, the diff- one of the most difficult part of the five books of Moses uh, because it talks about all of the uh, matters of korbanot, the sacrifices, purity, impurity, uh, very, very uh, deep subject that uh, uh, Chazal teach was uh, taught to children uh, because their uh, uh, souls were so, their, you know, were so pure that they were able to retain the information with much ease in comparison to adults that unfortunately made sins, and it's more difficult for them to absorb the information. So uh, as difficult as Vaika is, of course, there is a endless amount of lessons we can learn from it. But again, at the same token, we have to understand what's the connection between Vaika, uh, what's the connection between and, and Megillat Purim, what's the connection within uh, all of this and helping the poor people specifically at this time of the year. Um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, the uh, mitzvot that we have during this time of the year are very significant if you understand them. If you don't understand them, they just become, you know, very, uh, you know, robotic and, and meaningless. And it just seems like another opportunity to just spend money. 
uh, if you don't really understand the value of them. So first and foremost, we're going to uh, start off by um, going into the parasha. Uh, then we're going to go into Purim, connect it all Be'ezrat Hashem, and try to see where Kadosh Baruch Hu takes us before we start taking your questions. So Parashat Vayikra starts off with a, uh, a lesson in humility, but also a lesson in the significance of Moshe Rabbeinu in the eyes of Hashem. The first word, Vayikra, uh, where it says, Vayikra el Moshe, that uh, Hashem called Moshe. Uh, the, the word Vayikra has a small letter Aleph, an unusually small uh, letter Aleph in the word. Uh, in order to uh, give us the message that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest of all prophets, uh, you know, in Am Yisrael, but there was a great prophet, uh, you know, named Bilam for the Goim. But they were, although Bilam had a uh, certain strength that even Moshe Rabbeinu did not have, uh, certainly he was not beloved by Hashem like Moshe Rabbeinu was, because when Hashem calls Moshe, he calls him Vayikra, whereas when Hashem calls Bilam, he calls him Vayikil, which is missing that Aleph. So in essence, the, it's the same exact word, but there is that extra Aleph that HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu gives to Moshe. Why, why is this so important? Because Moshe Rabbeinu did not ask for this extra credit. He did not ask for this extra anything. In fact, uh, he thought that he was the equivalent to even the lowliest of men. And specifically because of this is why HaKadosh Baruch Hu loved him and also made him the vessel of the Torah itself. And Moshe Rabbeinu knew the entire Torah. He received the entire Torah. What he gave us, what he was allowed to give us, is the essence of the Torah. The essence of the Torah is what we have, uh, which is a, a endless amount of information to the point where Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkuna says that if the entire ocean was ink and all of the trees were quills, you know, that you can write with at the time. Uh, and uh, all of the land was paper. It would not be enough to write down all of the Torah knowledge that he knew himself. And what he knew, what Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinus knew, was not even a lick of water in the ocean in comparison to his uh, rabbi, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai. And of course, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai didn't know anywhere near as much Torah as Moshe Rabbeinu. So we see that the, the Torah is endless. And that's why even if you start off with the same exact topic, you can uh, elaborate on it literally to no end. Furthermore, we go into the Torah, we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us a Musar lesson. A Musar lesson through the Korbanot, through the sacrifices, where the Torah says, uh, in regards to the sacrifices, Adam ki akriv mikem korban la Adonai mina beema mina bakar. That a uh, um, when a uh, man. This is in chapter one uh, of uh, Vaikra, which is uh, Leviticus in English, chapter one, verse number two, where it talks about where it says, when a man among you brings an offering to Hashem from animals, from the cattle, or from the flock. Shall you bring your offering? So in the Hebrew word, the word behema is it's a kosher animal, uh, it's cattle, but and bakar is also, in essence, you're seeing here two words that are more or less synonymous, one after the other. So why say behema? Why say bakar? Now, if you say, listen, you know, you need to bring a sacrifice. Uh, you know, what kind of sacrifice are you going to bring? Oh, I'm going to bring a, uh, a cow. Oh, so you're bringing a behemoth. Okay. Now, if you go to the meat store and you say, listen, I want some meat, you're not going to tell the guy, I want behemoth or I want a cow. You're going to say, I want bakar. Bakar is the meat. But obviously, this is, it's the same thing. This is a cow. This is a car, but a cow. But there's two different words and they're used one after the other. So the Baalei Musar teaches here, that's because the first time the word for the animal, Bema, is used, it's not referring to the sacrifice, but rather referring to the one that's bringing the sacrifice, the person. The person that brought 
this sacrifice, this bakar, he is a behema. Why is he a behema? Because he made a sin. Now you say, yeah, but he, he, he did it unintentionally. If it was intentionally, the punishment would be much worse. The fact that he didn't pay attention to the reality that Hashem is watching everything, that he has to have fear of Hashem, that he has to be much more careful with his actions, that already puts him in a category where he's acting like a behema. He's acting like an animal. Why? An animal doesn't have rules. It could eat where it wants to eat. It could drink where it wants to drink. If it wants to drink its friend's uh, water, it'll drink its friend's water. If it wants to eat its uh, uh, friend's uh, 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 food, it'll eat its friend's food. It wants to walk. It wants to sleep. It wants to procreate. There's no uh, uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, a loyalty uh, among, the, uh, among the wives or the husbands in the animal world with the exception of a couple of exceptional animals like the dove. But the point being is, is that if an animal walks around and just decides to eat wherever, drink wherever, procreate wherever, you're not going to say, oh, that's a bad cow. You're just going to simply say, the cow is being a cow. But if a person, needless to say, if a Jew walks around as if there is no God in heaven that's actually watching every action and every thought that you do, does business in a way as if there's no God watching every transaction that you do. Handles their body or mishandles their body or her body as if there's no God that gave rules for morality, then in essence, that person is acting like a behemah, is acting like an animal. So the Torah tells us, this behemah that's bringing a behemah, it's bringing a, a, a sacrifice. He has rules, even for the sacrifice. And you say, yeah, but he did it accidentally, even then. If he didn't do it accidentally, he'd be much worse than just a behemoth. Much worse than a behemoth. Now, a person says, yeah, but sometimes you have to bring this behemoth where, uh, you know, you're not sure if you actually made a sin. How is it so? So Chazal bringing an example if the one person had was eating at the Bet HaMikdash. He's eating, he has to take a break, he's human, he has to eat, and he has two pieces of meat in front of them. Now, he put one piece of meat, and that meat was the meat that he has to, you know, he wants to eat kosher meat, good meat, everything else. The meat next to it looks the same, but it's actually chelev, and it's part of the sacrifice, and he's forbidden from eating it. Now, he eats the meat, and then his friend comes and goes, whoa, I think you just ate the wrong meat. Well, how do you know? I'm not sure. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. For that, he has to bring a sacrifice. Now he's going to say, yeah, listen, this, this uh, possible accident just cost me $25,000 to buy a cow to bring the sacrifice. Maybe I really didn't do it. Maybe it was just a loss of money. So Chazal says, no, the fact that you weren't paying attention to what you were doing means that you were acting like a bema anyway, which means that even though you may have not actually eaten the wrong meat, you may have not actually made the sin, the fact that you're not conscious of your actions already means that you're acting like an animal. So here we see Rabotai Karim already from the first couple of verses in this parasha, there's an endless amount of lessons for life. If you don't give yourself rules that to comply with, you're going to be a very, very difficult person to deal with. It's going to be very difficult for you to maintain any relationship with success over the long run. It's going to be very difficult for you to uh, enjoy life. Why? Because rules are necessary. On the other hand, if you give yourself man-made rules, it could even be worse. Why? Because the man-made rules, they change. They change with the times. They change with the attitudes. They change with the community. They're unfortunately not something that's stable. Today he likes this. The next week he likes that. One day the scientist says this. The next week he says something else. And this is the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu is telling us, Vigita Boyo Mam Velayla, that you got to learn Torah day and night. This is what he tells Yeshua Benun. You have to learn Torah. You have to learn Torah day and night. Why? Because these are the rules of God. 
God's rules do not change. No matter what the idol-worshipping Christians or the, uh, 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 the Muslims say, God's rules do not change. He gave us the rules. That's what they are. So what we have here, Rabotai Karim, is that HaKadosh Baruch is telling us it's not a matter of the Torah being good for you. You need the Torah. It's not a matter of the Torah being good for life. It is life. But unfortunately, a person that does not learn Torah is not going to believe that. He's not going to believe that the Torah is life. He's not going to believe that he needs Torah. It may be nice. It may be wise. It may be intellectually stimulating. It may even have some good advice. But I need it. Ah, come on now. You're exaggerating, Rabbi. And that's why the Torah itself gives us endless amount of lessons to remind us of the things that we need to know even before we believe them. Now, at the end of the parasha, we see that the, uh, there's all types of sin offerings, there's all types of uh, sacrifices that have to be brought. And one example of a sacrifice is a, uh, that's brought at the end of the parasha is when someone cheated in business. Now, this is relevant to everyone. Anyone that works, anyone that transacts business, anyone that buys, anyone that sells, in so many words, if you're breathing, this is relevant to you. Why? Because Chazal teaches us that while not everyone is going to make some of the bigger sins like violating Shabbat or, 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 or idol worship, Almost everyone is caught on stealing. Why? Because of the way they conduct their business. Because of the way people conduct their business, they cheat, they manipulate, they, they say one thing, but really it's something else because they figure, yeah, you know, he's rich, he could afford it. Like just because someone's rich, that somehow gives you permission to steal from him. Or just because someone is not knowledgeable, that means you, you have some type of permission to cheat him. So the problem is, is that when people have man-made rules, needless to say, their own set of rules that they create themselves, they are bound to be cheaters. They're bound Bound to be liars. They're bound to be people that suffer tremendously in their life from their own actions. Because even if they make a fortune of money from their cheating and their lying, that money will never have God's blessing, which means that the money will go to a bunch of different things that uh, you don't want to spend the money on. So yes, you may have 10 different stores making you $500,000 a month each but you'll end up seeing that all of that money, more or less, goes to a bunch of places you don't want to spend money on. You're spending money on lawyers because you're being sued. You're spending money on doctors because you're sick. You're spending money on fertility because your wife simply can't give birth to any child, even though she's young and healthy and you have no idea why she can't give birth. You're spending money on psychiatrists because you're depressed, but you don't know why. You're spending money on all types of things. And in reality, it looks like you're rich because you have a few toys. But if we go deep down inside to see what's going on in that kishke of yours, we find misery. We find unhappiness. We find depression. We find someone that wishes they weren't even born. Why? Because you're missing that blessing. All the money in the world is not going to help you. All the money in the world is not going to help you. And this Rabotai Karim is one of the things that brings that, aside from desecrating God's word, violating Shabbat, wasting seed, all the common things that we've mentioned many times over the years, one of the primary things that brings a curse to life and actually a curse to all of Am Yisrael is when Jews deal with business dishonestly and they don't have blessing. Now, here Chazal tell us that when somebody cheats God in business, somebody cheats God in business, meaning they take money from the Bet HaMikdash they found some golden cup. They like the golden cup. They take it for themselves. Now, they don't sell it. They don't use it. They just put it on the shelf as a uh, memorabilia. God is willing to not punish the person so long as he doesn't use it. 
if he uses it like a chashverosh, use the uh, garments, the eight garments of the Kohen Gadol, or like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, or Belshazzar, all of these reshaim used the, uh, the tools of the Bet HaMikdash and they got punished for it one, at one point or another. One of the reasons why uh, uh, Vashti is uh, killed off right at the beginning of Megillat Esther is because she wore the garments of the Kohen Gadol. She wore the Choshen while making, you know, without any clothes under it, of course, because she was like a Zona. And she made, unfortunately, the Jewish girls work on Shabbat without clothes at all. So that was one of the reasons why she got punished with sarat, a skin disease. Also, a tail came out of her and horn. And that's why she wasn't willing to go to Achashverosh when he called her. It wasn't because she was uh, suddenly embarrassed uh, and shy uh, for people looking at her. No, she walked around as if, uh, you know, she, God just created her. Like Chava was just created. But obviously, she, this is a woman that was a disgusting woman. But she, decided, she said that she's not going to Achashverosh because she got the punishment of a lifetime, which is the skin disease and the horn and the tail for, for desecrating God's word and also God's children. But more than anything else, if a person takes one of the things from the Bet HaMikdash, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is willing to, in essence, not punish him. If he uses it, punishment comes. But it's not the same if a Jew steals from somebody else. If a Jew steals from somebody else, whether it's stealing from them outright by taking some from, the, from them when they're not looking or cheating them in business, dishonesty and things of that nature, the Torah tells us that the person's sins are considered treacherous to God. They're considered an abomination. Why? Because, how, how is this uh, any different? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying that when we go against each other, we cheat other people, we're not just going against that person. We're going against the ultimate purpose of the entire Torah. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu considers a person that cheats in business as the most hateful person who denies God because once a person denies the authority of the lawgiver, where he's not following the mitzvot, he could easily violate all of the norms of morality as well. And this is the reason why there is no such thing as an honest atheist. There's no such thing as someone that is honest, but is also doesn't believe and follow God. There's no such thing. It's impossible. Once you deny God, you're certainly going to do even worse to people. But it's the same thing otherwise. Once you go against people, it's only a matter of time before you go against God. Now, the only way that a person can truly overcome these difficulties of the enticement of money, to cheat, the enticement of immorality, to cheat, the enticement of all of the sins, is by learning Torah. Now, learning Torah, most people don't understand the obligation. Most people do not understand the obligation of learning Torah. And they do it when they get a chance or with an attitude that is, when I get a chance, I will learn. When I get a chance. Now, during Purim, we have a unusual connection between the holiday and the rest of the Torah where we have several mitzvot that we're obligated to do Megillat Esther reading the Megillah as I said at night and then during the day in most places in the world you have to read it on the 14th which this year comes out on Motzei Shabbat, you're not allowed to read it during Shabbat. Uh, then you have to read it again during the morning. Uh, and then in uh, play, walled cities, you read it the, the following day. But there is an exception in questionable places where 
it's not sure if these places either had a choma, a wall, at the time of Yeshua ben Nun, or whether this is the particular place that the Torah is referring to or not. And in those particular places, which interestingly enough, one of them is Gaza, you are actually supposed to read it on two days, on the 14th and on the 15th. Now, Rav uh, um, Yitzchak Yosef Paskin, that because obviously there's a war going on right now and uh, reading at night is obviously dangerous for the soldiers, then they all have to read it only on uh, Motzei Shabbat uh, and uh, during the morning and not uh, the following day, not take the risk uh, twice. But the point being is, is that under normal circumstances, it would actually be two days uh, for that city and, and then several other places around, uh, uh, around the world and in, in, uh, in Israel. Now, aside from Megillah, we also have to do Mishloch Manot. We have to, you know, show unity by sending a uh, meal to uh, our friends, people we care about. Each man has to se- send at least two meals to, you know, to two different people, one to each person. And each woman has to send to at least two women. Women should not send to men. Men should not send to women. It's not appropriate. Unless you're sending it to your mother or your father or your brothers. But uh, it's supposed to be a meal where it's meaning it has to be at least a cake of some kind or some type of mezonot and a drink. Of course, if you can make a a meal, you can make a challah, something like that. Of course, the more the the better. But the point being is, is that it's supposed to be a meal and not just a box of candy. Candy is good, but it's not a meal unless you're five years old. Now, the amount of money that people spend on Mishloch Manot is uh, usually very generous, and uh, we enjoy Mishloch Manot very much and spend a fortune on them as well. Uh, But it's very important for a person to know that whatever you spend on Mishloch Manot, it should definitely not be as much as you spend on helping the poor. And the... Matanot Lev Yonim, helping the poor during uh, Purim is very, very critical. So much so that uh, anyone that comes to you uh, and with, a, with an open hand, meaning asking for tzedakah, you give them. You give them. Whoever they are, religious, not religious, young, old, they come to you. On this day, you give them. Now, of course, you can give based on your own uh, you know, what you have. If you're wealthy, you give more. If you're not so wealthy, you give less, but give. Nonetheless, give. We also have the mitzvah of uh, saying the bracha, adding the ala nesim to the birkat amazon, to our, uh, to our prayers. Uh, we have also the seuda on Purim itself, which is during the day. Uh, the seuda needs to be with meat and wine. Needs to be with meat and wine. Uh, don't have one of these veggie seudot uh, or vegan seudot. It has to be with meat. Uh, of course, kosher meat, everything kosher. Um, and uh, it's a prohibition to, to be sad, to be fasting, uh, to, to do a eulogy of some kind. Not allowed uh, to do that on the uh, day. Now, back to our subject at hand as far as why is Yeshua Benun? Why is Yeshua Benun really connected to all of this? The Gemara in Masechet Megillah, in the first daf, daf bet, Amud Aleph, uh, says that the uh, in the cities that were not walled at the time of Yeshua ben Nun, who was the disciple of Moshe Rabbeinu, Purim is celebrated on the 14th of Adar. And in the cities that were walled, at the time of Yeshua ben Nun's, they celebrate Purim on the 15th. Now, one of the reasons that Chazal, like Dran and other Chachamim, use as the reason why the walled cities celebrate the following day is because, if you remember at the end of the Megillah, the salvation came in twofold. After Haman was killed, his sons were hung, 
you know, of course, were able to fight against all of those people that wanted to kill the Jews. They were supposed to kill the Jews in one day. We were able to go defend ourselves and fight them. And after we finished fighting them and killing them during the first day, Esther comes to Achashverosh and asks if he would allow them to do it for another day, meaning that it wasn't finished. So Chazal says that during the in, in, inside the cities that were not walled, they already finished all business as far as killing their enemies already on the first day, on the 14th. But in the walled cities, they need a little bit more time to get in there, to find everybody, all of these enemies, all of these Nazis. We need a little bit more time. So that was the second day. That was the second day. Now, find that we have walled cities for that reason. But what's the connection to Yeshua ben Nun? What's the connection to Yeshua ben Nun? Chazal says, well, Yeshua ben Nun is the one that came to Eretz Yisrael with Am Yisrael and went and fought against 31 nations. There were 31 different nations living, the Canaanite nations that were living in Eretz Yisrael, and he went to war against 31 different nations, 31 different legions, armies, huge wars. Yeshua ben Nun was a hero, unlike anything we could possibly imagine. So he deserves some respect. Fine, but why on Purim? Why not? I don't know. Make a special holiday. Yeshua ben Nun Day. Why not mention him on, uh, I don't know, uh, during some other uh, Sukkot, I don't know, or, or Shavuot, or some other time. Why Purim? Yes, he conquered the land of Israel. Fine. But the whole miracle of Purim was hundreds of years later. So anyone that looks at the beginning of the book of Joshua, which is the first book of the Tanakh after the five books of Moses, you'll see that Yeshua bin goes to war. But during the war, one of the wars, one of the many wars, Yeshua ben Nun had some battle, they fought, there's blood, there's people, Baruch Hashem, winning. Yeshua ben Nun is in his camp. It's later on in the day. And all of a sudden, he raises his head and he sees a man with a sword out. And this was no ordinary man. And he asks the man, are you with us? Or have you come to kill us? And the man says, I am not a human being. I am from the army of God. Okay. Are you here to kill us? To fight with us? He says, I'm here in the name of the Torah. Why aren't you studying Torah? Now, it's not like Yeshua ben Nun was playing video games. It's not like Yeshua ben Nun was, you know, exercising or playing with his kids. He had a war. After a war, after a war to manage. But the angel comes and says to him that I am in the, from the, I'm the angel in the army of God and I came here because why isn't there a Shi'ul Torah? Instead of continuing this dialogue, Chachamim tell us the Yeshua ben Nun on the spot stopped everything that he was doing and went into the depth of Allahic study. This is not like a Musar or a Muna Shi'ur or uh, just a shiur about the weekly parasha, not that there's anything wrong with them, but we're talking about the deepest level of Torah study, highest level of Torah study, is the depths of halacha. And Yeshua ben Nun instantly went in there. Why? Because Yeshua ben Nun knew 
that there is a mitzvah. Is a mitzvah that we are never allowed to abandon the Torah under any condition. And the Rambam paskins this da'alacha, telling us that whether you are sick or old or young or busy or working or poor or rich or married and everything in your life needs your attention wants your attention needs your time wants your time your wife wants your time she wants to go to the mall she wants to talk about the kids she wants to talk about what to cook for shabbat she wants to talk about whether she's fat or whether she's skinny or whether we're going to have another kid or whether uh, this or whether that and then after you finish with her the kids need your time and they want abba to play and they want abba to help them with the homework and they want abba to uh, go around and uh, you know walk around the neighborhood and they want this and they want that and after you finish that then the boss calls and he you need you to work this weekend and he needs you to work overtime and he needs you to become more dedicated to work and he needs you to produce more and then after you finish with him the customer calls and the customer says listen if you don't start delivering better i'm going to your competition and i want you to do this and i want you to do that and before you know it you're already sick to your stomach and i don't feel good and i don't want to do this and i can't and you're in the bathroom for five hours and you're throwing up and you can't even eat and you can't even drink and guess what you still need to learn Torah you still need to learn Torah Yeshua ben Nun is telling us no matter what you're doing even if you're in the middle of a war the moment you have a you're not killing somebody or being killed there's a break obligated to learn Torah that moment you're obligated to learn Torah now Rabotai there are a couple of times during the year where it's less Torah is being learned. On Purim and on Yom Kippurim. On Yom Kippurim, it's a day of atonement, one of the high holidays, the Jewish people spend the overwhelming majority of that day, the 25 hours or so, fasting, praying, doing tshuva, there's very little time, especially if you're Sephardi, for anything else. First night, pray for a few hours with the long vidui at the end to save some time for the following day so you could actually pray Musaf in time. So you do a big part of the prayer of the tikkun already on the first night. Then you get a little bit of sleep. You start early in the day, especially in Eretz Yisrael, when we went there for the holidays, we already started praying at 5 o'clock in the morning. And it wasn't because we wanted to uh, finish uh, in, uh, you know, by, by 6 or 7 or 8. We prayed for hours. But you start early in the day. I know in other places around the world, they don't necessarily start that early. Usually they start even later, start at 9 or 8.30 or 8. But uh, some of the keilot that are very, very committed do the same thing as Eretz Yisrael where they start 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and once you finish 5, 6, 7 hours later there's a short break of maybe an hour or two even 3 depending on, again, on how fast people pray and, and so on, what time you started. Usually there's about 2 hour break. During that two hours, most people rest. And then you go back to prayer for another five hours. So there's very little time. So therefore, there's less Torah being learned during that day. For obvious reasons. It's not like you're hanging out playing video games. You're, uh, you're praying. The other day that there's less Torah being learned is on Purim. Why? Because you have in the morning, you have to read the Megillah. And then on top of that, you have to do the Mishloch Manot. Mishloch Manot have to be done on the, uh, during the day, not at night. Then you have to uh, make sure that uh, you're, you're, you're helping the poor on that day. 
So anyone that contributes to our campaign, you know, we're obviously going to have everything that we're doing on the days of Purim and not just a, uh, uh, not just uh, uh, ahead of time. We have to make sure that the uh, the five the thousand people that are learning are going to be learning on the days of Purim. And we're having some people in Yerushalayim, some people in Netanya, in a few different places because there's a couple of days to cover ground for everyone that's contributing regardless of where you live. But point being is, is that after you do the Megillah, after you help the poor, after you do the Mishloch Manot, then you have the Mishteh. You have the feast. Feast, you have a good time, drink a little bit, eat a little bit, have fun with the kids. Uh, maybe uh, have some activities, you know, all types of things. And before you know it, you have to go pray mincha. So there's less Torah usually learned by people during Purim. Many times people don't learn at all. Hence the reason why Yeshua Benun is connected to this holiday, even though he preceded Purim by hundreds of years. Yeshua Benun conquered Eretz Yisrael. Not because he was the greatest warrior in history. Not because he was the smartest man in history. Not because he was the richest man in history. Not because of any other reason other than the fact that Yeshua Benun made sure to commit himself and Am Israel to the Torah. And he fulfilled the obligation of learning Torah day and night despite the battle and the moment he got even the message of a rebuke it didn't he didn't require a further discussion he didn't require a anyone to convince him on the spot he was already able to go into the depths of Allah which means that he was learning Torah already at other times and therefore he was able to go and continue what he was already doing. It's just that there was a break which logically made sense but spiritually was forbidden. And the same concept goes for us. We have to understand that even though Purim and the rest of the year are full of excuses of why we're not going to have time to learn Torah. We have to make sure that we find the time to learn Torah. And when we're not learning Torah, we have to make sure that our spiritual meter is still going. Someone is learning Torah on our behalf. Someone is doing tshuva on our behalf. How can we do that? If you're not learning Torah, that means that you're either sleeping or you're working. Or you're spending some time with family. It's not that much options outside from that even during those few times working sleeping family you have to make sure that that spiritual meter is going how by making sure that part of the money that you're making from the business deals that you're doing from the real estate investments that you're doing from the entrepreneurship that you're doing from the job for the local uh, government office that you're doing whatever it is that you're doing you take part of that money and you invest it into helping people learn Torah, into helping people do tshuva. Why? Because once you take at least the maaser, the 10% that you have, and you invest it into the Torah, that means that you are taking that time that you worked for and you're not looking to collect the money to go buy yourself more food and become fatter, to go buy yourself more toys that you can't even fit in your house, to... You're not, no, you're looking to use the money that Hashem gave you to increase Torah in the world. Because even though you yourself can't learn during that time, you still have an obligation to learn. And therefore you do it. Now, sometimes the most extraordinary examples are what's necessary for people to understand or for the message to really hit home. Now, many times when you tell people, invest into Kiruv, invest into learning Torah, into Kolel, either people give just blindly to whoever, whenever, without really putting too much thought into it, like they would put into a real estate investment or a stock investment or a business investment of some kind. 
uh, almost like it's a burden, like they're paying a bill. Or they're going to give, but not as much as they give for something that is more close to their heart, such as helping poor people. Now, I'm here to tell you that even for those that like to help poor people more than they like to publicize Torah, there's an example that will show you that even that, if we're not investing in Torah, we won't have the merit and the ability and the know-how to invest properly even to help poor people. What's the example? Right now, everyone that's Jewish is aware of the fact that we are in a war, not only in a war in Gaza, but different parts of the Middle East, different parts of the world, some on the battlefield, some on the technological end, some on the political end. There's a war against Am Yisrael. Anti-Semitism is openly acceptable everywhere across the board. Now, there is a war. But the part of the war that hurts everyone, that still has a Jewish heart, or is close to the Jewish people, is the hostages. The hostages that the Ishmaelimi Machshimam Vizichram took, raped, murdered, and whoever still left, the hostages they still have. Everyone thinks about the hostages and it breaks their heart. Now, if I told you, what if I can find a way to get Mishloach Manot, Mishloach Manot of Purim, to each one of the hostages in Aza, in Gaza, over there? Which one of you is going to sign up? Is there a Jewish person that will not sign up? Is there a Jewish person that's not going to go all out on this Mishloch Manot? Now you're not going to send the Mishloch Manot with a couple of chocolates and a little root beer. No! You're going to send them a whole barbecue machine with the steaks inside broiling. You're going to put some pita in there. You put hummus. You put uh, matbucha. You put uh, Sephardi food, Ashkenazi food. You're going to put Yemenite food. You're going to put every food under the sun and you're going to make sure to give it in every variety of kashrut. Maybe it's edat charidit. Maybe it's matbuch. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a, uh, just, uh, you know, the uh, uh, OU, whatever it is. You're going to make sure that the kashrut is not a problem. The type of food, not a problem. What, he has celiac maybe? We'll give him gluten-free. What, he likes the meat only? We'll give him every type of meat. He likes, what does he like? He likes the, uh, the, 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 uh, the stuff that's fattening? We'll give him some candy. We'll give him some chocolates. We'll give him some cheese. We'll give him some this. We'll give him some that. Each mishloch manot is going to be an investment and a half. If it costs you less than $1,500 a person, I'd be surprised. And that's just for one, that's just for you. Imagine, you have to do two of them. $3,000, Rabbi, no problem. You're going to get into the hostages? No problem. Can I give more than two, Rabbi? I say, fine, you give more than two, but not too much. Oh, can I give 10? What? No, 10. I just, two. 10, 10, Rabbi, can you do me a favor? I want 10 hostages. I want to give my Mishloch Manot $1,500 at a clip for 10 people. Can I do it? All right, fine, fine, fine. Before you know it, He's got a thousand Mishloch Manot. Oh, I told you ten. Ten maximum. He goes, no, no, ten for me, but I brought my friends. What, your friends also want to give Mishloch Manot? Yeah. What, they're doing the same thing? No, they did a little bit more. Each one, two, three, four thousand dollars Mishloch Manot. Before you know it, you raised a hundred million dollars in Mishloch Manot. Why? It's going to the hostages. It's going to the hostages. Well, you don't want them to have Mishloch Manot, Rabbi. Get them the, you know, you got the connections. Go to Aza, right? You're going to give them the Mishloch Manot. Before you know it, you raised a million, two million, five million, five hundred million dollars to go to the hostages. To give Mishloch Manot. Why? You want to do mitzvah, right? You want to do mitzvah. Now let me ask you a question. The hostages, you're right. If you could help them, you should help them. If you could send them Mishloch Manot, you should send Mishloch Manot. But is the hostage, whoever it is, whether it's that little cute baby, may Hashem protect him, or it's the mother, 
or it's the guy that's sitting next to him, or it's somebody else's daughter, or somebody else's son, or somebody else's father, are any of them better than the Jewish people that are not hostages right now? But they're not hostages of Aza, but they're hostages of poverty, where they don't have food, they don't have money to even have a celebration on Hanukkah. They don't have money to celebrate Pesach. They don't have money to celebrate Shavuot. And needless to say, they don't have money to celebrate Purim right now. They don't have money. They're not hostages of the Ishmaelim. They're hostages of our stinginess and our selective giving. We're going to give things that are close to our heart. When you give to things that are close to your heart, you're giving things that are sometimes far from a Kadosh Baruch desire. There are literally endless amount of people that we can help right now in Eretz Yisrael. We've gone far above and beyond year after year to help the poor in Eretz Yisrael, not only during the holidays and before the holidays, but during the entire year. Every day there's a new story. Every day somebody else is getting married and they don't have money to pay for the wedding. Every day somebody's having a baby and they need to pay for basic things. Every day somebody needs diapers. Every day somebody needs food for their five kids and the husband died or the husband left or something happened. Every day there's a new story. And every day we try to do whatever we can. Yeah, just put it on the card. Put it on the card. Uh, Rabbi, the, the card is, is, is getting tired already. Yeah, just put it on the card. You want to do a campaign? No time for campaigns. Just more. Just help these poor people. What are you going to do? There's literally not enough, not enough, not enough time in a day to help all the people that we could possibly help. But unfortunately, when people make decisions based on their emotions instead of based on what the Torah obligates us to do we make the wrong decisions now I agree with you if I had the opportunity to send a Mishloach Manot to each one of the hostages I'll easily send a $1,500 Mishloach Manot to them but you know what that means also that when I help the poor people, I have to give nothing less than $1,500. Nothing less than $3,000. Nothing less than whatever it is I would do to something that pinches my heart. So when I see people send me messages and say, Rabbi, I uh, donated to the campaign. And they send me a screenshot of, the, of what they donated. It makes me happy they donate. Unless I know them a little more. And I know that this guy makes $100,000 a year. This girl makes a quarter million dollars a year. This guy makes a half a million dollars a year. This person lives in a $2 million house. And they show me some receipt of some $50 donation or $100 or $200. And I say to myself, would they give the same amount if I told them, let's give it to the hostages? I bet you not. Now, they're not bad people, because obviously if they're giving, they're decent people. You're all decent people. We're all decent people if we're giving, if we're learning. We're all decent people. We're not trying to do anything bad. But the problem is that we're ignorant of the Torah. We're clueless of the Torah. And therefore, many times we make decisions based on emotions and not based on what the Torah obligates us. That's why, Rabotai, when Yeshua ben Nun heard that the Malach is there in the name of the Torah because there's no Torah being learned right there and then, he didn't need any further explanation. Immediately he went inside to the depths of the Torah. And that's why Yeshua ben Nun had the blessing to conquer 31 different nations. That's why Yeshua ben Nun had to receive the kavod, the honor of having this entire holiday of Purim decided based on his time, what he saw, what he did. If there was a walled city, the holidays on this day. 
If it's not a walled city at the time of Yeshua ben Nun, it's on a different day. Why? Because the only reason why Akadosh Baruch Hu gave us the land of Israel is because of the Torah. Is because of the dedication of the Torah. Not just picking up a Sefer Torah and kissing it, but rather listening and living by the words inside it. Not just saying we know the story of the written Torah, but living by the rules and the depth of the oral Torah. When a person simply decides to dedicate themselves to the Torah, that means emotions, garbage. Akadosh Baruch Hu's will, that's what's going to make my decisions. With that, Rabotai Karim, we will be able to not only celebrate Purim the way it's supposed to be celebrated with Torah, with mitzvot, with chesed, but we're going to do it in a measure that HaKadosh Baruch Hu blessed us on that day and the rest of the year because that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants from us. We need to make sure we use every tool that He gives us in order to serve Him, and not just simply serve ourselves and somehow fit HaKadosh Baruch Hu in to our life, in our world. After we know this, after we live like this, we'll be able to literally destroy Amalek. And we'll finish off with a story that may not necessarily give us so much details about the chesed, but will tell us the details of the power of Torah when someone has it. About 10 years ago, a story was publicized where literally the power of Torah came to life. There was a Jewish man that uh, religious, learns Torah, follows mitzvot, good guy, driving one day in America. And he's driving, driving. And uh, as he gets to some street, last second, he sees in front of him some old man ran into the street, ignoring the lights, ignoring the traffic, ignoring everything else, and it was not enough time for him to stop the car, and he hit the old man and killed him. Of course, the Jewish guy is not happy about this situation. He's very, very upset. He killed an old man, but it's even scary because with that there being a death, police arrive, court cases, charges, after they review the footage from the cameras everywhere, they see that really the driver, the Jewish driver, was not at fault. The old man was irresponsible and just literally ran into the street in the last minute, not giving anybody, giving the driver even a, a, you know, enough time to stop. And uh, it was really an accident. So the Jewish man is released from this, but he still feels horrible. Because after all, a Jewish neshama doesn't want to kill anybody. Doesn't want to kill anybody. And he feels bad about it. He says he learns in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu megelgel zchut al yedei zakai vechova al yedei chayav. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives those that have merit. He gives those that have merit opportunities to earn even more merit. And those that have sins, opportunities to create more sins, more problems. So why did I have, why did Hashem give me this tragedy? What sin did I make? He said, I learned Torah, I commit myself to Torah, I follow the mitzvot. Why did Hashem have me as the tool to kill this old man? And it bothered him to no end. Where do you go when something bothers you to no end? You go to the world of Torah. And he went to the Sara Torah. He went to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Allah shalom. Rav Chaim Kanievsky, aside from being a, literally a 
giant in Torah, he was also known for giving very, very short and minimal answers. Blessings were bua bua. Bracha v'atzlacha, bracha v'atzlacha. Meaning the acronym of the words he would use. He would give very short answers. When this man came to see Rav Chaim Kanievsky, he tells him, Rabbi, you know, this happened to me. I, you know, I learned Torah, I do mitzvot, I do all these different things. I don't understand why this happened to me. I killed this old man. Now, even though he's a guy, still, why, why, why do I have to kill somebody? Why is Hashem using me to kill somebody? What did I do? Rav Chaim Kanievsky thinks for a second and looks at him and he says, Amalek. What? Me? No, no, I keep Torah. He goes, no. Amalek. Meaning that the man that he killed, the old man that he killed, was Amalek. Which there's a mitzvah. If you know who Amalek is, it's a mitzvah to kill them. We have a Masoret that the Nazis were Amalek. Also, the Abarbanel says that when Edom marries uh, Ishmael, they also create Amalek. There's all types of Amalek out there. The main common denominator among Amalek is not just anti-Semitism, but anti-Torah. But how would you know that this old man in America is Amalek? Now, you don't ask these types of questions to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. You just simply accept the answer, say thank you very much, and go on your life. But this, this Jewish man, he couldn't, he, it just bothered him. Why did the Rav, the Sarah Torah, he doesn't say anything for no reason. He's not going to say something to pacify me. I know that what he's saying obviously has meaning, but why? Why Why Amalek? Why not say measure for measure, reward and punishment, whatever it is? Like why, out of all the answers in the world, he says to me that the reason why I killed this guy is because he's Amalek, but it was an accident. Why should I be used to kill Amalek? And it bothered this man to no end. Now, the old man that he killed didn't have a wife or kids and lived in some house. And the Jewish guy found out the house and he decided to go there. Nobody's obviously in the house. And he says, I have to see who this guy is. I want to learn who he is. He decided to break into the house, snuck into the house, maybe through a window or something. And started looking at the house, and he sees regular house, everything is very neat, very proper, very clean, looks, some basic stuff, nothing out of the ordinary, kitchen, uh, living room, all basic stuff, goes to his bedroom, goes to the bedroom, and he sees there's some things that are normal in the bedroom. And then there's some boxes under the bed. So he decides, let's just look at some of these boxes. Maybe we'll find some things that are relevant to this picture to get to know who this man that I killed is. And he opens the boxes. He opens the boxes. And he opens the boxes. Do you know what happens after he opens the boxes? Well, I'm going to tell you what happens after he opens the boxes. And once I tell you what, what happens after he opens the boxes, you're going to think that you already know the whole story. And you're going to think, wow, amazing. Rav Chaim Kanievsky is amazing. But no, no, no. You still don't know the whole story. Because even after I tell you what happens after he opens the boxes, you have to stay tuned to see what actually happens after he opens the boxes. He opens the boxes, Rabotai Yekarim. He opens the boxes. And he sees pictures inside the boxes. But those pictures were not from last week or last month or even last year. Those pictures were from the Holocaust. Those pictures were from the Nazi army. Those pictures were inside the Holocaust, inside the concentration camp. Those pictures showed that this old man, Imach Shimo Vezicho, was a Nazi, a Nazi murderer inside the Holocaust that escaped the Holocaust, came to America and lived in peace. 
And inside these pictures, you see this Nazi, this Amalek, inside these pictures, posing, laughing, while there's dead Jews everywhere. And as this Jew is flipping through the pictures, he can't believe it. Rav Chaim Kanievsky was right. He was right. This guy is Amalek. But I still need to know, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu use me to kill Amalek? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu use me to kill Amalek? On Shabbat, we have to read Parashat Zachor, which is to remember Amalek, our ultimate enemy. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu use me to kill Amalek, this Nazi? He sees through the pictures, another picture, another picture, and more dead Jews, and more smiling Nazis. And this man is in every one of the pictures. And he goes through one after another until he gets to a picture that shocks him and is going to shock you. In the picture, he sees his grandfather. His grandfather is kneeling there on his knees with a gun to its head. The holder of the gun is the old man that he killed. And this was the last picture of his grandfather before he got murdered by that same old man that he killed. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made sure that this Jew not only learns Torah, lives Torah, but sees the Torah and the measure for measure and used him to take revenge against Amalek, but not just any Amalek, the very same Amalek that killed and murdered in cold blood his grandfather and was proud of it to such an extent that he even kept a picture of it. Rabotai Karim, Amalek is alive and well. But sometimes Amalek comes in physical form like the Nazis, like the Ishmaelim that murdered us on the 7th of October. But sometimes Amalek is inside our heart and is hiding in there with all types of heretical thoughts, all types of foolishness, all types of anti-Torah and anti-God beliefs. But it's so subtle that we don't even realize that it's there. During these next couple of days, we have to fulfill all of these mitzvot. But on top of everything else, we have to use this time to destroy Amalek, the one that's in our heart, the one that tells us not to listen to Da'at Torah, the one that tells us the opposite of what the will of Hashem, the one that tells us to follow our emotions, to follow what we see, to follow what we hear, to follow what HaKadosh Baruch Hu says not to do. As we read in Shema Yisrael, every single day, multiple times a day, don't follow what your eyes and heart tell you. Follow the Torah. If you follow the Torah, you'll be following the will of Hashem. With that being said, Rabotai, you Bezat Hashem will give us some questions and the Kadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. See, I'm going to start off with some people from Facebook and then we'll go to TikTok and YouTube. Let's see, what do we got? Nice comments, nice blessings, but I'm looking for questions. Okay, let's look. Maybe we'll find something here. Second, here we go. Is, is Bilam the name or title of... Uh, is Bilshan? Is Bilshan the name or title of Mordechai? Uh, not to my knowledge. Do I have to choose definitively what Rivka's age was via the interpretation? Where well, there's a Masoet, there is a uh, tradition uh, of her being three years old, six years old, 
I mean, as long as it's within one of those, uh, you know, options that the sages have told us, uh, you're fine. But you can't just simply decide that she was 25 years old and, uh, you know, in six feet five uh, height and inches. You can't just decide what it is. It has to be something that agrees with our tradition. Rabbi, why do some Jews wear the talit katan on the outside of their shirt while some wear it on the inside and some on the outside? Uh, so that's simply uh, custom and comfort. So there is a uh, uh, importance of wearing tzitzit, which talit katan like this, is a mitzvah from the Torah. Uh, and uh, anytime you wear a four-cornered garment, you have to wear, uh, as a man, you have to wear a tzitzit. Now, there's no obligation to have it on the inside or on the outside. It's whatever you prefer. Some... Uh, some uh, customs were, uh, you know, preferred it to be on the outside like I have it right now. Uh, but some uh, decided that they uh, prefer it to be on the inside. Now, uh, in regards to the customs, you know, again, it was, you know, there's, there's different reasons for it. One of the reasons that uh, the ones that are wearing it on the inside is because the Arizal said that when you have the tzitzit on the outside... It uh, could be enticing the uh, mezikim, the uh, negative spirits that are out there, and which, if you're not holy enough, can create damage, meaning they can attack you. Uh, so it's better to have the tzitzit on the inside. Uh, so that's why the, those uh, that wear it on the inside, they're following that custom, that teaching of the Arizal. Uh, on the other hand, there are others that are saying, listen, even though there are mezikim, and even though the mezikim could be dangerous, if you wear wearing tzitzit, it'll protect you. And it's important. It's more important for you to be uh, visually Jewish, meaning to show your Judaism and the pride that you have of Judaism on the exterior, than it is for you to be concerned about mezikim. And therefore, you should wear uh, you know, your Jewish garments in such a fashion that you're noticeably Jewish, you know, by your tzitzit, by the way you look. That's why, for example, the first time in the entire Tanakh that the word Yehudi, Jew, appears is in Megillat Estel. And that Yehudi is Mordechai Yehudi. Mordechai was the Jew. Why is, uh, you know, they say, or is Mordechai Yehudi? Uh, why, why Mordechai Yehudi? Why didn't they just say Mordechai? Obviously, we would know he was a Jew. Because Mordechai was visually Jewish from far away because he had long and big fat peot, just like, you know, I have, but magnified much, much more, that even from far away, you were able to see that this is a Jew that's coming. There's no way that this guy is not Jewish, because obviously, especially in those times, it was very uh, difficult to, you know, to determine who's Jewish based on clothing, because the clothing, everybody had similar clothing, they had the tarbush, you know, this, uh, they had the uh, uh, kaftan, uh, they had, you know, similar clothing. So, how can you tell this is a Jew and this is an Arab, this is a Persian, this is a, uh, how would you know? The way that uh, was uh, Mordechai and the Jews uh, and showed themselves as Jews was their peot, was their peot. That's why uh, these are called also simanim, signs, signs. So Mordechai the Jew, first time in the Torah that the word Jew appears is in Megillat Estel. So uh, as far as the uh, back to the tzitzit uh, question, those that uh, are in the uh, tradition of wearing the tzitzit on the outside uh, say that, listen, uh, you know, uh, wearing it on the outside, being visibly Jewish is a very, very important mitzvah in itself. It's uh, not only uh, showing your Jewish proud, uh, your Jewish pride. You're showing that your 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 observance of the Torah, of the mitzvot, but also it shows your fear of heaven and not fear of man. You know, many times people, you know, they uh, they you know say that they're not wearing a kippah or they're not visually Jewish because they're afraid of anti-Semitism. This is complete nonsense of the Yetzirah. Rabbi Vadia one time came to a, uh, a community 
of uh, of Syrian Jews, and he uh, and he noticed that many of the uh, Jews uh, in the Syrian community were Torah observant, but many of them were not wearing a kippah. We're not wearing a kippah. He said, actually, this is one of the stories that Rabbi Tzach Yosef said recently in his shiul. Uh, he said that, uh, and he was there on a trip. One of the uh, people in the community that would actually teach Gemara every day, Daf Yomi, he would teach Gemara, serious Gemara. It was Talmit Chacham. But then the Rav saw him later on that week that he was in uh, that he was in the community. He saw the guy walking around without bald head, no keeper. So, oh, hey, how could it be? And he said to the Rabbi, Rabbi, listen, you know, I'm scared of anti-Semitism. I'm scared of anti-Semitism. That's why he didn't wear a keeper. This, obviously, the rabbi didn't accept it. He said, at least wear a hat, wear a casket, wear something. Point being is, is that if you're not covering your head as a Jew, it's not because you're afraid of anti-Semitism. It's because you're falling for the trap of the Satan, the Yetzara, that's making you scared of man instead of making you scared of Hashem. Because the whole point of wearing a kippah is symbolic of your fear of God. That's what the wearing a kippah is. It's your symbolic of your fear of God. You don't wear a kippah, that's because you're not afraid of God. You're afraid of somebody else more than God. And that's a problem. That's a very serious problem. So it's important for a Jew to be visually Jewish. To, to be, to, you can see that they're Jewish. Now, there's no obligation for you to uh, wear the Hasidic garment or, or the tzitzit outside or anything like that. It's, you can wear it on the inside. You could wear a, uh, a you know a, uh, a kippah, or you could wear a hat, but the point is is to do something, to do something. You don't have to wear a uh, a beard. You don't have to have a beard, uh, but certainly it's a you know that doesn't mean that you're allowed to shave your uh, face with a knife. The point being is is that a person needs to know that their Judaism should not be separate from their life in any way should not be separate from your life in any way. In fact, it should be something that uh, you're proud of, that you're, uh, that, uh, that you're, uh, you're, you're taking with you. Now you're going to say, wait, but uh, what about if some uh, Nazi kills me because I look Jewish or robs me? If you truly believe in the Torah, you'll know that the Gemara in Masechet Chulin, page 7, says that even before you prick yourself in the finger with a needle, there has to be a judgment in Shemaim to determine whether you deserve it or not. Meaning that no one can help you or hurt you if it's not the will of Hashem. And therefore, you wearing a kippah or not wearing a kippah, wearing a tzitzit or not wearing a tzitzit, that is not the determining factor of whether anti-Semitism will hurt you or not, or, or, or someone will rob you or not. What's going to determine that is whether you have merits or obligations, whether you deserve to have the suffering or you don't deserve to have the suffering. And that's based on you following the Torah or ignoring the Torah. If you follow the Torah, then you don't have to worry about anyone helping you or hurting you because everything that's happening to you is the will of Hashem. Everything that's happening to you is the will of Hashem. But if you don't follow the Torah, then of course you're going to disagree with what I say. You're going to disagree with the Torah. You're going to rationalize things. You're going to say, nah, but you don't understand where I live. People are this, people are that. Listen, Habibi, I grew up in a place where my school was in the projects. I grew up in a place where gangsters were my classmates, okay? I'm very, very familiar with danger. I'm very familiar with death. I'm very familiar with a lot of things that are not so rabbi-ish. I understand. I'm not delirious. I'm not oblivious. I'm very, very well familiar. I've had, Baruch Hashem, all types of people go in and out of my life, need some help, need some this, need some that. I help all types of people. I have some students that unfortunately, their communication to me is only once every few months because they're in jail uh, for different types of crimes that it's better not to hear. I have some people that, uh, you know, have uh, got out of jail. All types of wonderful people that we try to help in every way and I've seen a lot. So, for a second, don't think it's because I'm ignorant of the world it's not simply said the torah tells us clearly akadosh Bahu runs the world and od milvado there's nothing else but him the moment we fear anything but hashem we are already veering towards the road of idol worship 
of idol worship. Anytime you fear anything but God, you're already on the path of idol worship. There's different levels of idol worship. The Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara says that Avraham Avinu had 400, 400 segments to the tractate of Abu Dazara, meaning there are different levels of Abu Dazara. It's not so simple, it's just a statue. There's different levels of Abu Dazara. And when a person fears God less, that already means they're on the road closer to idolatry and further from Hashem. They fear Hashem more, that means they're closer to Hashem and further from idolatry. So when a person says and justifies them not being visually Jewish to the extent where you literally can't tell whether they're Jewish or not Jewish, they're not wearing a kippah, they're not, uh, you know, they're not learning uh, Torah, at least nothing to speak of that anybody would even recognize. The problem that they don't realize is that this answer that I'm providing, they don't have the spiritual tools to accept it. Why? Because you're living a life that's so far away from the Torah that none of what I say makes sense to you because you're, the way you calculate things is based on your perception of them, your emotional connection to them, your understanding of them with the tools you have. And the tools you have are the secular world. So you're seeing on the news, this Jewish guy got attacked. That Jewish guy got attacked. That synagogue got burned. That guy uh, is in, uh, you know, terrorist. You're seeing things based on the human perspective. And therefore, you're going to determine based on the human perspective that if you are less visually Jewish, that means that you are going to increase your safety. Just like people think that the more weapons they have in their house, the more safe they are. This is antithetical to the Torah because that means that you're giving something else power above God. Above God. If a person, if a person is protected by God, that means that nobody in the world can hurt them. Nobody in the world can hurt them even if they're inside Gaza. Even if somebody shoots directly at them. How many miracle stories have there been of people having shot, you know, uh, people being attacked, people having diseases, people having accidents, all types of miraculous things were simply said, HaKadosh Baruch decided, today is not the day you're going to die. Even though the laws of nature, the laws of logic, the laws of science said you are going to die, but no, God said no. Endless amount of miracles have happened throughout history and endless amount of miracles happen every single day. The moment we remove our understanding that everything is a miracle, whether the open miracles or the hidden miracles or even the things that we've gotten accustomed to, like blinking and seeing, the moment we remove ourselves from everything being a miracle, we little by little veer towards idolatry, towards things that are antithetical to the Torah. So if you are already on the Torah path and have humbled yourself to a certain extent to realize that not everything is going to make sense to you right away, uh, but certainly it's the truth if it's coming from a Torah, then you will be able to learn more and more and get, uh, and get uh, closer to Hashem. But if you're, going to, uh, if you're going to simply use your logic, on, it's going to be very difficult for you to live life uh, of Torah. Now, I'm not saying that you should go and go inside a camp of terrorists and tell them, listen, I'm Jewish, but don't, you know, you're not going to touch me. No one says put yourself into open risk. Wearing a kippah does not increase your risk. Wearing a tzitzit does not increase your risk any more than wearing a hat, any more than uh, going to certain neighborhoods, any more than anything else. It, the reality is that if you say that a kippah increases your risk, then put a hat. There are plenty of non-Jews that wear hats. So what's your justification of not wearing a hat? Now, if uh, you say, okay, the, uh, the, the tzitzit increases my risk, fine. So put the tzitzit inside. No one knows what's under your shirt. Why aren't you still wearing a tzitzit? What? Just in case they decide to undress you? The point being is that a person needs to know that a Kadosh Baruch Hu knows the real reasons of why we do what we do and, you know, and, and really what's behind it. Many times when a person is connected to Hashem, the more connected to Hashem they are, the more they are open about their Judaism, happy about their Judaism, proud about their Judaism, and confident about their Judaism, and no one in the world can scare them. No one in the world can scare them. 
the further a person is from the Torah itself, but they're close to, let's say, the superficial part of Judaism, such as the customs. They like Purim, but not necessarily Yom Kippur. Uh, you know, they like Hanukkah, but they don't necessarily like Rosh Hashanah. You know, they don't necessarily like Pesach. Uh, they like Chol Moed, but not Yom Tov. So the more people are, uh, uh, you know, close to the customs, uh, you know, and the, the traditions, but not the laws, the more difficult it is going to be for them to, uh, to feel the Torah. To feel the Torah. But as a person learns more and more Torah, the, 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 they're going to realize that God is the one that rules the world and no one else. And there's nothing for you to be afraid of. Not an army, not a battalion, not a terrorist group, not a governor, not a president, not a boss, not a customer, not a anything. Only thing you need to be afraid of is a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Once you know that, life becomes much, much more pleasant. But al also says not to put yourself in unnecessary danger. Like I just explained, wearing a, uh, something on your head does not increase your danger. Even if you say that a keeper increases your danger, you can still wear a hat. Even if you say wearing a tzitzit increases your danger, you can still put it under your, uh, under your shirt. No one can see the tzitzit. Point being is, is that a, uh, uh, you know, a person is uh, fooling themselves if they're not wearing a tzitzit and, a, uh, and, a, and a, something to cover their head uh, because they think that increases their danger because there's other ways to do that without uh, even uh, uh, that argument being valid. Uh, can one also commemorate another person during the same time, during the same uh, evening, whose yard shall be five days later, knowing that there won't be ten men present there? You can do mitzvot uh, on the behalf of somebody you care about at any time, even if it's just you by yourself. You can give charity on their behalf, you can pray on their behalf, you can learn on their behalf. Uh, but certainly it's better if uh, there, it's done where there's more than one person, where there's at least a minyan. Uh, but uh, sometimes having a minyan is not possible for different reasons. But certainly you could do a mitzvah even uh, without you being there. You could uh, simply uh, help do a mitzvah on behalf of that person. Fear of Hashem is determined by wearing a kippah and showing the whole world that I'm Jewish. Uh, yes, according to the Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, the fear of Hashem is, uh, sim- is symbolized by your kippah. It's not necessarily just because you have a kippah doesn't mean you fear Hashem, but it's symbolized by it. Just like a, if somebody walks around with a leavdil, uh, a cross, on their uh, on their neck or they're tattooed across, then it's, they, they're symbolizing that they're not Jewish. They're symbolizing that they're representing Christianity. Uh, you know, they believe in Yoshke. Somebody walks around with a uh, the garments or uh, the traditions, uh, cultures of Islam. You know that they're that's what they are. A kippa is symbolic of of Judaism, but not just Judaism in general. Rather, the Gemara says. The, the kippah is supposed to cover your entire head because, in essence, you're saying that you know that Hashem is everywhere. Hashem is everywhere. He's overseeing everything. The more of your head that it covers, the more you're fulfilling the actual halacha and because you're, in essence, saying that Hashem is omnipresent. Omnipresent. Rabbi, I trace my lineage back to King David. Congratulations. I just bought some tzitzit and kippah while I was thinking recently. Baruch Hashem, good for you. Um, where do you sell tefillin? Tefillin you can buy on our website. Um... Be'ezrathashem.org, B-E-E-Z-R-A-T-H-A-S-H-E-M.org. That's our website. Over there, there's a store. 
and make sure to pick the right tefillin. There is tefillin for Ashkenazim, tefillin for Sephardim, uh, and there's also this tefillin of Rabbeinu Tam. Uh, so uh, after you buy a tefillin, also uh, let us know, send us a message, let us know, or write in the notes over there whether you're, uh, you write with your right hand or with your left hand, because the tefillin are put in the opposite hand. And only order tefillin if you are Jewish. Uh, we're not allowed to sell tefillin or mezuzot to non-Jews, even if the non-Jew is very righteous and very generous and very wonderful. It's simply forbidden for us uh, to sell it to non-Jews. That's what the Shulchan Aruch says. The same Torah that we're learning today is the Torah that tells us that we're not allowed to sell tefillin or mezuzot to non-Jews, even if they're wonderful. But again, they could benefit from other parts. They could help us with chesed. They could help us with other mitzvot. They could learn uh, you know, Musar with us. Uh, but uh, again, it's important for you to uh, know that if you uh, order tefillin or mezuzah from a Jew... Uh, and let's say they don't ask you or you fool them to make them think that you're Jewish and therefore they sell it to you, you're actually making that uh, Jew sin. Uh, you're making that Jew sin. They have an unintentional sin. And that's certainly a problem for them and even a bigger problem for you because you know that you're not allowed to do it. So, uh, But if you're Jewish, certainly you can get a top-of-the-line tefillin from our website. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, we have the Rashi tefillin, we have this, uh, the um, uh, for uh, Sephardi and for Ashkenazi, right hand, left hand, and we also have Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam is a, uh, extremely important for people that are married, Jews that are married and uh, want to elevate their uh, level of holiness. Rav Vadya was very, very particular about making sure that every married uh, person uh, in his community, in the Sephardic uh, community, had Rabbeinu Tam. Uh, it's a higher uh, level of Kedusha, even though we don't do a blessing on it. It's an absolute must uh, for, uh, for a married Jew to have Rabbeinu Tam, uh, and uh, you should at least study some Torah with it every day, even if you're only studying Torah for 5-10 minutes after you pray. Make sure that the Rabbeinu Tam tefillin are on your head. It'll, uh, it'll help you uh, tremendously. It'll help you tremendously. Uh, I have some uh, some uh, some Talmidim that are Talmidim of mine that are very receptive, and some of them are just completely like oblivious to the things that I say. I don't know how uh, they call uh, themselves my Talmidim, but uh, you know uh, it's 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 amazing to me. Sometimes I uh, I, I see that you know certain Talmidim of mine are uh, you know very very particular about things they do, what they're supposed to do. They learn, they listen, they they do everything, and then some of them you know they're they're like. Uh, uh, they just like to say that they listen, but in reality, they don't listen. And sometimes they don't listen about Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin. Sometimes they don't listen about what to learn. Sometimes they don't listen about, uh, you know, different, you know, really, really particular things that are a big deal, that are a big deal. And um, it's very important for a person to have a rabbi that they trust, that their Da Torah, which means that if the rabbi says it, you simply do it. Whether you agree, disagree is irrelevant. If you trust this rabbi, you have to listen to them. You don't have to make me a rabbi. I'm not looking for any more students, but you definitely need to make yourselves rabbis that you trust everything that they say and you're going to do what they say. Why? Because that's what the Torah tells us. That's what the Torah tells us. That's what the Torah tells us that we, we must do. And when people start picking and choosing which advice, which teaching, which lesson of the rabbi they're going to listen to and which, they're, uh, which they won't. Unfortunately, instead of fulfilling uh, the words of the Torah that's uh, in, uh, it's said in the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 14, uh, that the person that listens to uh, you know, the, um, uh, the Torah is obviously righteous. Instead of that, it's a person that's wicked, where he's looking for the, uh, the ones that fit his agenda, either the leniencies of Bet Shammai and the leniencies of Bet Hillel, or, uh, you know, or the uh, stringencies of Bet Shammai and stringencies of Bet Hillel, meaning they only want to listen to extreme cases. And, and those two cases are, unfortunately, not the righteous people, even if they wear a kippah. So if you're uh, going to have a rabbi, you have to listen to what they say. Uh, if you're not going to listen to what they say, then you have to find a different rabbi. You have to find a different rabbi. Why? Because if without a rabbi, Rabotai, we are we are we're uh, we're non-existent people. We're not existent people, and that's that's uh, that's one of the things that people simply don't understand. 
So, uh, you know, Rav Avadia made a very, very particular uh, point to make sure that Am Yisrael wears, uh, you know, talit, tefillin, and so on, but also Rabbeinu Tam tefillin are a very, very big deal. So any of you that don't have it, you should get it. Whether you get it from me or not, I don't really care. It's, it's, it's up to you. Uh, but the point is, if you're a married man, uh, get yourself Rabbeinu Tam tefillin. I have Jewish DNA because of my grandfather. Do you need to have Jewish mother in order to uh, in order to convert? No, in order to convert, you don't have to have any Jewish in your uh, in your lineage. In order to convert, you just need to learn Torah, follow the Torah, make the necessary life changes, and go to a Jewish Orthodox Jewish beddin uh, that will uh, you know guide you until they convert you. Uh, but in order to uh, be Jewish, either you have to do it through conversion or if somebody has a Jewish mother. Uh, but uh, we don't determine Judaism based on DNA. Uh, we determine Judaism based on the, uh, the mother. If she's Jewish and it's uh, provable that she's Jewish, then the children are Jewish. So Rabbi, can you tell us about the upcoming Purim celebration? We already did that earlier today, Baruch Hashem. I heard from a rabbi that online conversions are not valid. You heard correctly, online conversions are meaningless. Jewish conversion is determined by Allah. Allah says that a Jew has to go through a process. In order to convert, they have to dip into a mikveh, they, and uh, they have to... Um, Except the uh, the Torah in front of three kosher dayanim, uh, which uh, have to be uh, uh, you know Orthodox Jews, not conservative, not reformed, not non-Jewish. They have to be considered kosher dayanim. If it's a male, they have to have a brit milah, uh, circumcision. Uh, even if they had a circumcision at birth at some hospital, the uh, the uh, they still has to be checked. Uh, before the conversion date to make sure that there was a proper brit milah, or if not, they have to fix it uh, under the supervision of the bedin. Uh, and uh, if they have a proper uh, circumcision, then they would still have to do what's called a atafat adam, which is a uh, just uh, pricking the, uh, the, uh, the male member with a small uh, needle uh, in order to generate some, uh, some blood. It's like the same thing that they use for like uh, people that uh, test their bloods for diabetes. So it's that little tiny little uh, needle, uh, and that's called atafat adam. But uh, it's a process. Conversion is not something you could do on the internet. Conversion, it's not something that you could just simply uh, pay for it and therefore you become Jewish. Conversion means that you are accepting upon yourself the laws of the Torah, and the laws of the Torah also include the laws of conversion. Is it true that converts are Jews who in their past life renounced the Shem and the Torah? Uh, it's possible, uh, but not necessarily always the case. There's no uh, rule of thumb that it's always that. Uh, sometimes it's Jews that abandon the Torah in their previous carnation uh, in one way or another, whether it's going to idolatry or it's being intermarried uh, or, uh, or something else. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's uh, a, a very precious non-Jewish person uh, that was born non-Jewish and always was non-Jewish, but was one of the people of the nations that wanted the Torah at the time Am Yisrael received the Torah, but couldn't be part of it because the nation that they were part of did not want the Torah. And therefore Hashem promised those, uh, those neshamot that they will have a chance to convert later on. In so many words... It's not for naught that somebody wants to convert. If somebody wants to convert to Judaism, authentic Judaism, that means that their neshama is connected to Judaism uh, you know, from, uh, from some point. It doesn't make them Jewish. It doesn't mean that they were Jewish necessarily. It could be, but not necessarily. But either way, it means that they have to convert. There are many times that people that spend too much energy on who they were in their previous life or who they believe they are in this life don't waste your time. Follow the Torah. Live the Torah. Don't, you know, harp on the past or delve too much into the future, you know, because the present is what we have to live. The present is what we have to be concerned about, not the uh, past 
or even the future. Because the past, there's nothing you can do about, and the future is not really uh, something that you can control. What you can control is the present. If you have a good present, the future uh, is more likely to be pleasant also. Uh, so the uh, Messiah is supposed to be from the uh, lineage of, from the bloodline of King David. So how his DNA doesn't matter uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, you know we we have a tradition, a tradition of uh, people that have come from a certain uh, certain family. Like for example, the Kohanim. We know that the Kohanim go all the way back to Aaron Cohen. We also know that the vast majority of Jews in the world today are from the tribe of Yehuda, which is the tribe of King David. So uh, many Jews today uh, could very well be from, uh, from the uh, family of King David, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's Mashiach. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, we don't have to figure out who the Mashiach is because the Torah already promises us that Eliyahu Navi is going to come and he's going to tell us in the name of God who the Mashiach is. So we don't have to exert any type of energy figuring out when the Mashiach is going to arrive or who the Mashiach is going to be. We don't have to do any blood checks. We don't have to do any DNA checks or anything like that. So that's that's another reason. Uh, now, the, the, the third aspect of it is that while people put a lot of weight into DNA as far as they believe it's something that's so substantial that uh, you need to do, change the law based on it, uh, what they don't realize is that uh, as sophisticated as DNA is, the criminals are more sophisticated. They're more sophisticated, and there's actually ways to alter the DNA, alter the tests, uh, make mistakes, and, uh, and this is something that apparently people are either ignoring or they're oblivious of, uh, but either way, uh, you know, the uh, Torah did not tell us to determine who's Jewish and who's not based on DNA tests that only became possible in recent generation. The Torah told us to determine who's Jewish and who's not based on the law. The law says if the mother is Jewish, then the son or the daughter is Jewish. If uh, the, uh, the person converts to Judaism then they, uh, and they accept the burden of Torah upon them, they follow it, then they're Jewish. That's it. We don't need the DNA test. We don't need modern day technology in order to change our Torah. We can use modern day t- technology uh, to help our lives as long as it doesn't contradict the Torah or expect us to change the Torah, but to just simply decide a new law based on something that just came up in the last... Uh, you know, a couple of decades that's questionable uh, whether it's legitimate or not in, in many aspects and certainly can be ma- uh, manipulated. I- I'm not really uh, sure if you guys are as educated about uh, DNA as you think you are. But either way, Judaism does not determine itself based on DNA. Judaism is determined based on the laws of the Torah. This is the same exact thing that I tell all of the uh, uh uh, foolish leaders uh, and absolute morons in some cases that go from the uh, 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 Hebrew Israelites uh, that uh, that harp on the fact that they are Jewish uh, even though they don't follow the Torah, even though they don't know anything about Torah, even though they follow idolatry of the New Testament, even though they literally don't have any concept whatsoever of what determines your Judaism or not, they determine themselves to be the real Jews based on their skin color because they're of darker complexion. This literally, anyone that learns Torah, uh, like literally, if you have a scale where like on, on one side there's like intellect and on the other side there's stupidity, what would happen is if you put the determining factor of how the Hebrew Israelites, uh, you know, which were originally called, I think, black Hebrew Israelites because most of them are black people, but not necessarily all of them anymore. Apparently they're recruiting some Mexicans and some other people of darker complexion. Pretty much as long as you're not Jewish really and as long as you're not white, you could be part of the uh, part of this new movement. Anyway, what happened here is that if you 
look at their deciding factor of what makes you Jewish, being the skin color, uh, as, as uh, you know, you put it on the scale, one side is stupid, one side is smart, intellect, right? When you put it on that side, what would happen is that the stupid side would be so heavy that it would break the scale, go through the ground, all the way to the bottom of the equator. And then everybody's going to sue you because you ruined the world. Like literally, if you actually put this, 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 this vomit that comes out of their mouth and you put it on a scale, you make it tangible, you put it on a scale, the mass of stupidity would be at such a high level, it would literally put a hole in the world. That's how dumb it is. Why? Because the Torah is as clear as day with what the rules are. It's not subjective it's not you know determined by different people at different we have clear laws and when a person comes to the jewish people and starts telling them that they're not real jews and that's because you're not black that's because uh this all these stupid things it's like i can't believe that uh people are falling for this it's, it's just, it's a sad state for humanity. Uh, now, of course, there are some people uh, that, uh, you know, want to believe that they're Jews for, for different reasons. But again, there's no reason to, uh, you know, uh, live a fantasy. You want to be Jewish, you're welcome to become Jewish. Follow the Torah. Follow what makes people Jewish, which is following the Torah. Simple. Then you say, yeah, but many Jews don't follow the Torah. You're right, many Jews don't follow the Torah, but since their mother was Jewish, and their, you know, this is not something that just happened, their mother and their mother's mother and their mother's mother, all the way to the original, they were Jewish, whether they followed the Torah or not, it's, it's, they're still Jewish. Now, Allah, you don't treat them as a regular Jew, you treat them as someone of, obviously, it's a sinner, but nonetheless, they're still Jewish, they're still within that Torah law. You that came in as a non-Jew from non-Jewish parents to just decide that you're Jewish because you have a certain skin color? I, I mean, I don't know where they found this, if not a comic book, but it's certainly not in the Torah. It's certainly not in the Torah. Uh, and it's sad that, they, that this, uh, this uh, movement is a uh, cult. Is, uh, is unfortunately growing and, and, and is just really harming people's lives. It makes them very, very hateful people. Now, of course, they're going to say, I'm hateful and I'm this and I'm that. But, you know, by all means, anyone that looks at the track record of people that I have helped and compares it to all of the black Hebrew Israelite organizations combined, combined, combined all of them throughout all of history. All of them throughout all of history, combine it to what I do by myself, without even including Rav Ephraim, without including Rav Shavit, without including anybody that has no religion, just me by myself, against all of the black Hebrew Israelites, throughout all of their history, and you compare it to what I do in one month, one, you know about one week, and there's no comparison. Why? Because they don't help anybody. They don't help anybody. They help themselves. They enrich themselves. They make people hateful, and unfortunately, they don't help anybody. And this came from their own people. Their own people that have contacted us, their own people that have written publicly about them, their own people that have come out out of this cult have admitted that it's literally a whole big fraud. But everything that's against the Torah is a fraud. It's just that, unfortunately, people are blinded, blinded by all types of false beliefs. Sometimes those false beliefs come from within, and you have to remove it. If it's against the Torah, it's against the truth. It's against God. Stay away from it. Next question.
As a Noahide, am I required to tithe? And then the other question is, oh, it's somebody else, but whatever, I'll ask it. It's, uh, can you expand on the words from before all the words? The worlds from this, before this world? Okay, so as far as a Noahide, are you obligated to tithe to give 10% of your income? Obligated? No. Is it a good recommendation? Sure, if you're going to give it for the sake of publicizing Torah and helping Jews do tshuva. It's certainly going to help you in your life and your eternity. If you help one Jew do tshuva, needless to say, if you help many Jews do tshuva, you're going to have endless amount of blessings both in this world and the next, much more than you will get from anything else that you do on your own. Uh, but as far as is it obligation? No, just like it, you're not obligated to work a full-time job. Uh, you're not obligated to be ambitious. You're not obligated to uh, to succeed. Uh, you're not obligated to uh, to eat uh, a healthy diet. You're not also obligated to you know to eat very much. But we do usually uh, many of those things that I just mentioned. Why? Because there's a benefit to doing all of those things. There's a benefit to doing all of those things. And a person that looks at the benefit of what they do. Is, is going to live accordingly. When a person looks at the benefit of simply this world, they're going to live for this world. When a person looks at the benefits of eternity, they're going to live their life according to what is going to benefit their eternity. Uh, as far as the worlds before this world, uh, the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, page 12a, says that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the, uh, the world from nothing, meaning that before there was a world, there was just him. There was just him, and he had to, in essence, minimize himself, uh, if you will, it's obviously figuratively speaking, but minimize himself in order to make room for his creation. Uh, and uh, once he uh, minimized himself, he created everything from a single, you know, a single point, and you know, it allowed it to expand. This is obviously referring to the universe that's expanding until he roared and for it to stop uh and uh this uh roar is uh scared the heavens and from fear they stopped expanding and uh this is why the uh fear of god is called fear of heaven you know fear of god feels fear of heaven so it's symbolic of that original fear now uh of course uh, this was not the end of creation. C creation continued. Uh, the Zohar Kadosh talks about how, what, what was HaKadosh Baruch Hu doing? It's even in the Gemara. What was HaKadosh Baruch Hu doing before this world? Now, he created the uh, Torah before he created the creation. 974 generations before he created this world, he created the, 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 the everything, he created the Torah with black fire on white fire. But before he created this world, if you will, there were other worlds. So Hashem creates and builds and destroyed world. And in essence, there were six worlds before this world. This is the seventh and the final world. We don't have much information about what was in there, uh, what was in those other worlds. Uh, but nonetheless, there were apparently other worlds. Uh, whether it was a uh, same thing like we have right now or, or, or something different, obviously, uh, that I, uh, I don't remember that uh, existing or learning that anywhere. But uh, from, uh, from, you know, from my uh, understanding and what I've learned from my Rav and, uh, and even other Rabbanim that have talked about this particular topic is that, uh, and ultimately, the, the, the primary of all creation is this world is this uh, is this life not something that happened before or something that will happen after? Now, as far as uh, uh, the the reason why there's not much uh, discussion about these other worlds or other planets uh, or let's say topics such as UFOs or even other creatures that are within this planet. You know, there are many other creatures and entire civilizations that live in this world, some of which are mentioned in the Gemara, some of which are discussed and, and were actually uh, uh, communicating and living among Shlomo HaMelech. Uh, he brought them into his kingdom. Uh, there's a whole uh, uh, nation of, 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 of small people, uh, and there is a, uh, there's, uh, you know, all types of uh, sea creatures. There's a... Uh, uh, all types of different uh, creatures that are in this world, ones that have multiple heads, ones that are very, very small. Many times, I mean, if you, if you uh, uh, 
um, look at some of the descriptions of how these uh, these beings look like. They look like what people think is aliens, you know. But uh, they actually live in this world. And uh, different Gemarot and Midrash talks about uh, how uh, they, you know, different times that they encountered uh, regular people. Uh, there were also giants at the time of uh, of um, uh, at the time of um, uh, Noah, at the time of Moshe Rabenu, at the time of uh, David Amelech. Uh, point being is, is that there is certainly different creatures that live in this world. And the reason why we don't have a lot of details about their likes, their dislikes, uh, their uh, what their life is all about, and all that stuff is because it does not affect our life. Meaning that the only things that are mentioned in the Torah uh, that in, 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 you know, with extensive amount of information are things that are going to affect our life, are things that are relevant to our life. Which means that if it's not something that is relevant to our life, it's either not going to be mentioned in the Torah uh, in, at all, or you know, a, a very, very limited amount. Uh, now, when I say it's not mentioned in the Torah at all, I don't mean like it doesn't exist in the Torah, because everything exists in the Torah, but rather it's not something that you're going to find an entire book about it, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's just, you're going to have little tidbits here and there, Somebody mentioning it, somebody uh, talking about, it, but not something that's as extensive as, let's say, the uh, the laws of Shabbat or the laws of Muktze or the laws of a uh, Kashrut or or even the, the basic uh, uh, commentary on uh, you know on the uh, uh, one of the verses in the Torah. You're not going to have uh, much about it. Uh, why? Because it doesn't have much to do with your life. And the Torah is a, is an instruction set for life. And if you remember earlier today, I said that the Torah that we received is the essence of the Torah. The Torah itself, the Torah itself is much, much greater than the essence of a Torah. The essence of a Torah is what we have, which is literally millions of books. Endless amount of Torah. The real Torah is exponentially bigger, but it's impossible for us to comprehend it. And it's the reason why once a person goes to heaven, goes to Allah Abba, what are we going to do there? We're going to be learning the Torah itself, which is much, much greater than the endless amount of Torah, the, the essence of a Torah that we already have. So, uh, and the endless Torah uh, has everything and anything that you can possibly imagine multiplied by infinity, and you're still not even at 1% of what the Torah actually has. Uh, and this is uh, actually what was shown to Moshe Rabbeinu. But what he gave us is the essence of a Torah. The essence of a Torah, because that's what human beings can uh, can handle, can study, and can use uh, as their instruction set for uh, instruction set for life. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions before we're done. Uh, let's see. Okay, I see the guys in uh, Facebook woke up. All right, bunch of questions. Let's see. Rabbi, is deja vu a significant feeling in uh, in Judaism? I don't really know what you mean by significant feeling. Does somebody feel deja vu sometimes? Sure, it's possible uh, either do through uh, reincarnation, where they remember a certain thing that they experienced in their previous life, uh, or because there's a certain message that's being given to them, or perhaps they even took drugs and they think they saw something that they didn't. Uh, there's different reasons for it, but uh, as far as it calling it a significant feeling, I wouldn't call it a significant feeling, but it's certainly something that can happen. Uh, must women wear parashat zachol? Must, oh, must women hear parashat zachol this Shabbat? Yes, women have to hear parashat zachol. Can women go pray at the kvarim of the tzaddikim? Uh, she can if there is a direct... Uh, uh, road to the kever of the tzaddik and not to go through the cemetery at all. It is a terrible idea for a woman to go to the cemetery. Uh, some chachamim even say even the grave sites of tzaddikim are problematic. And one of the reasons why is because the uh, graves, uh, graves have tum'ah. Uh, and uh, a woman doesn't understand what that really means until she suffers from it, which is that 
the Tum'ah of the graves could enter her body through her reproductive organ and she could lose the ability to reproduce or actually have a miscarriage. Uh, so going to a, uh, uh, to a grave site is a horrible, horrible idea for a woman. Horrible idea. And as far as going to the grave site of Tzadikim, only if there is a direct uh, you know, road directly, in, meaning literally like the steps directly to the grave site, even in that case, if you're still trying to have kids, I wouldn't recommend it. What were the prayers and actions King David engaged in after midnight? Uh, David Melech delved into every aspect of the Torah, uh, but the biggest part of the Torah that you deal with, that you learn after midnight, is the oral Torah. If we say Berkat the Mazon on bread, that may not be halachically considered bread. Is it speaking Hashem's name in vain? Yes. It's not allowed. You can't just decide to say Berkat the Mazon on uh, something that's not. Can you recommend a book I can give my secular cousin's future wife uh, so she can understand the importance of the mitzvah of mikveh? Uh, well, first, I would recommend for her to read the book Netive O. Netive O by Rav Nisimi again. This will get her to understand the importance of being a, a Jew that follows the Torah. In there, he also discusses mikveh uh, alongside many, many other subjects. It's a very easy, smooth, beautiful read. It comes from his lectures. I would recommend all of the books of Rav Nisimi again as a pretty much a permanent fixture in your houses. Uh, as well as in your neshamot, uh, it's unfortunate that very uh, it's very difficult to get those books in uh, in the U.S. Uh, we sell them on our website, but uh, there's a uh, it's sad that you know you can't almost can't get them anywhere else um, because it's from my perspective it's the best books uh, on the market in the English language uh, and certainly uh, some some of the best in the you know last uh, generation or so written out there. He was like one of the uh, last Baalei Musaw that actually brought new things to, to, to the world. Um, I don't know how to explain that. Like there is usually when you teach, uh, you're, you're feeding off of the previous generation uh, and you're simply giving people what was already said. Uh, there are very few that are fortunate enough to have the Siat Dishmai to bring original ideas that also are, are, are on top of the uh, the tradition, but there's still original examples, analogies. Uh, he was literally one of the last ones that uh, was one of uh, that created created things that uh, were unbelievable. Anyway, I would recommend for us to read that. Uh, now, as far as learning the laws of mikveh as well as the importance of mikveh, there's a book by uh, that was translated to English by Rav uh, Mordechai Eliyahu, Alava Shalom. Uh, there is a uh, also a book written uh, based on the laws of uh, mikveh on the psakim of Rav Ovadi Yosef. Uh, so there's several different uh, types, um, but honestly, a woman that doesn't understand the mitzvah of mikveh, it's usually because she doesn't understand anything from the Torah at all. So it's important for her to understand the Torah and the book Netive O uh, by Rav Nisim again is a fantastic uh, read. So it's also very fluid, very easy to read, even though it's a huge book, 800 pages. Uh, it's uh, very easy. You'll probably finish it in a few days. Um, it's nude for a woman to wear a Purim costume. Is a woman allowed to wear a costume? If it's modest, she's allowed. But if it's not modest, then she's not allowed. Uh, so if a woman, let's say, for example, wants to uh, uh, dress up I don't know, let's just for argument's sake, let's see, she wants to dress up like she's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, she's a tomato, or she's uh, some type of vegetable, or she's some type of fruit. There's no problem with that costume. She wants to dress up like she is a, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a, a spaceship or something. I don't know. Fine, no problem. But if she wants to dress up like she's some erotic figure in some comic book, uh, then of course she's not allowed uh, to leave the house with such a thing. 
Uh, so it uh, depends. Depends what the custom is. Robert, do you believe that some people are born to become gay or lesbian? Uh, certain people are born with the inclination more than others, but to stay that way, no one's allowed to stay that way. No. They claim they don't feel comfortable in their own skin because they were born to be... That's nonsense. It's like somebody saying they were born to be a thief because they feel the need to take everything that belongs to somebody else. Uh, we are not uh, robots. We can overcome desires. Even if somebody has a strong desire to do something, if the Torah says it's forbidden, then obviously the Torah knows that you have a strong desire and uh, the law was still given, even though God knew that there's going to be certain people throughout all of the generations that will have a strong desire to act like Sodom and Gomorrah, like the generation of Noah. God still gave the law with that knowledge that he's going to create people that will have an inclination that's the opposite of his will. Uh, why would he do that? Because there is an obligation for us to overcome our, uh, our desires and follow what the Torah says and not just uh, treat ourselves like victims that are incapable of, uh, of controlling ourselves. Rabbi, someone told me that you used to be gay and became a Baal Tshuva. Is this true? Uh, no, it's not true. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're joking and you're just one of these clowns uh, or you're actually asking a serious question. But regardless, no, I absolutely never was and never will be a uh, homosexual. I find it despicable, disgusting, and, uh, you know, very, very unfortunate mental case. Um, what about wearing a Magen David? If you want to wear a Magen David, by all means. It doesn't make you any more or less Jewish, but uh, if you want to wear a Magen David, by all means, enjoy it. What does Pirkei Avot mean when it says that anyone who is beloved by people is beloved by Hashem? Uh, we have an entire shiur about that particular Mishnah in the Pirkei Avot series. Go watch it. In general, if a person is following the laws of a Torah that are relevant to how to treat people, then that's going to create unity and peace between him and or her and other people, other Jewish people, which when they have that unity, they have that uh, kingship between them, that's pleasing to Hashem. Uh, but that's again, f you know, there's, a, uh, there's permissible unity and there's forbidden unity. You can't just be united with everybody. Uh, because if that person is an enemy of God, you're not allowed to be uh, united with them. If that person uh, is uh, in, against the Torah, you can't be united with such a person. Uh, there's different types of unity. It's just like a person says, well, aren't you supposed to love everybody? I don't think your spouse would agree. If you said to your wife, listen, can't I just love everybody? She'll tell you, you can if you're single, not if you're married to me. Why? You have to, you know, you can't love every woman. Just like uh, if your wife said, now why? I want to love everyone. Your husband says, well, you know, then you can't stay married to me. Why? If you want to love everyone, you're going to be an adulteress. I don't want to marry an adulteress. So the point is, is that in a liberal world, everybody wants to be together and everybody wants to love everyone, but that's a fake, uh, it's a fake uh, imagination. No one really wants it. It's just people uh, like to be destructive of whatever, the, uh, whatever good is and whatever the norm is. Uh, and unfortunately, this is uh, coming from miseducation, ignorance, and arrogance. Uh, so the, what the Mishnah is saying to us is that if we have unity based on the definition of the Torah between people, then Hashem will be pleased with us, and therefore that's, uh, that's good for people, and that's good for your relationship with Hashem. Okay, I think I... Oh, here we go. Uh, what What is the most important trait your most successful students have? Uh, most important trait is submissiveness, meaning they're submissive to the Torah and they're submissive to Da Torah. 
uh, meaning whatever the, uh, if they ask, you know, uh, if they're going to do something, if they have a question about something, uh, they uh, already know that even if they think they know, they have to ask. And even if something doesn't make sense to them, but it says in the Torah, they have to follow. They're submissive to the Torah, uh, but also they are uh, submissive to the fact that the Torah is bigger than them. Many times people fail uh, in their uh, observance of Torah, mitzvot, yirat shamayim, and everything, even if they are religious. They fail miserably because they feel like they know enough or they know a lot. And uh, I can tell you that uh, from experience that the more people think they know, the less they actually do know. And uh, the more people think they know, the uh, usually the further they are from where they think they are. Uh, the uh, t- you know now some people will say no no I know that the rabbi knows a lot more than me but there's always like a but meaning that they know how to say something but in reality they feel something else so when a person thinks that they already know everything that uh, there's to talk about one particular subject or they're uh, experts in a specific subject or they know more than the uh, the rabbi or needless to say they uh, disagree with chachamim needless to say times a million they disagree with gedolei adol those types of people are not only a danger to themselves but they're a danger to society uh, why because they're not submissive to the torah uh, you know some of the biggest heretics in history were people that you would call torah scholars they were very very learned in torah but because they were not submissive to the Torah, they manipulated the Torah according to their likings. And unfortunately, because they had so much knowledge, they were able to succeed in getting followers. People like Shabtai Tzvi, uh, Shem Reshaim Yerkav. He was an extraordinary Talmud Chacham. He knew an enormous amount of Torah. Uh, Yerovam ben Nevat. The Gemara says he knew an enormous amount of Torah. He was one of the Gedolei Adol. He knew 127 Chidushim on every subject in the Torah. Doeg uh, Adomi was one of the Sanhedrin. These were people that were enormous Torah scholars, but because they were not submissive to the Torah, uh, which comes from humility, which comes from Yirat Shamaim, which, which comes from having a solid foundation, uh, the uh, person uh, doesn't have it. They could become a manipulator, a liar, a cheater, uh, and a heretic, uh, but... Uh, live a life without thinking for a second that they're even, uh, they've ever even done something wicked. You know, they're convinced in their own eyes. They're righteous in their own hearts, as the Pasuk says. So as far as the most successful people that uh, I've seen, or really anyone has seen, is people that have been submissive uh, to the Torah. Now, uh, it's hard to find uh, people like that uh, because, um, unfortunately, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's something that uh, you have to work on. You know, you have to, you know, and part of the way of working on it is actually by learning Torah. Where if you don't know what the Torah is, it's very hard to be submissive to the Torah. There are some, you know, uh, Balebatim, people that don't know necessarily much Torah, but were uh, submissive to the Torah and uh, became, uh, 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 you know, religious Jews and ended up having uh, children as, uh, that became uh, big rabbis. Uh, this was the uh, many of the Talmudim of Rav Avadia. They used to come to his uh, to his shurim when uh, when he was giving his shurim every day and uh, you know each week he would test some of them regular people. Balabatim, he would uh, they themselves many of them did not necessarily become Torah scholars. They all became religious, obviously, but they didn't become necessarily Torah scholars. But every one of them had religious families and 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 uh, uh, kids that became Torah scholars, and many of them became the biggest rabbis in the world today. Why? Because the parents. Uh, were submissive to the Torah. Uh, so when a person uh, is, you know, hears something from their rabbi, and their uh, their inclination is uh, not even necessarily to reject it, but that they have an option aside from what the rabbi said, already it shows that they're not submissive. Meaning, if you're asking a question, and already in your mind, the answer that the rabbi is going to give you know, it's not necessarily set into stone. Like, you're going to ask someone else, you're not necessarily uh, uh, committed to agreeing upon it or something like that. Already that means you're not submissive. 
And if you're not submissive, it's going to be very, very hard for you to ever develop true Yirat Shamaim, true Emunah, true anything. It's always going to have that, uh, that problem. Now again, it's a uh, person, uh, you know, uh, could be a decent human being, uh, but in order to get to a higher level, it's, uh, it's very important to, uh, to submit to the Torah. The more a person submits to the Torah, uh, the more they can become a vessel. Uh, now, I can tell you, you know, from, from Talmidei Chachamim that I know, uh, when, uh, you know, sometimes I'm like a, uh, um, you know, like a, like a fly on the wall among Talmidei Chachamim, whether it's uh, when I'm just sitting there and they're discussing different laws of the Torah, different uh, judgments, or there's email exchange and I'm just simply being copied in it and I see the communication among them. Um, the humblest person, humblest person that's, that's, uh, that's a, uh, uh, you know, um, that you could find among the regular people is much more arrogant about their Torah knowledge than any of these Torah scholars are, if you understand what I mean. Like, these are Torah giants. They literally have significant segments of the Torah in their mind, in front of them, as if, it's, as if they're, they're, they're flipping through the pages. Enormous bodies of work. They're able to do multiple things at the same time. I don't really... Like, a lot of the stuff that I know and I've seen through, through being close to, to serious Torah scholars, it's, I don't even tell you guys because... Some of it is impossible to explain. Uh, it's like you can't believe it until you see it. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not talking about supernatural abilities. I'm talking about just simply uh, the, the, the abilities, period, the knowledge, period, the behavior, the, 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 the mannerisms, the way they are, who they are, what they say, what they believe. Uh, it's, it's a world of difference from the, 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 the world that uh, that we see and and unfortunately many times when people are uh, not familiar with true torah scholarship and, and what the torah is and they get their learning just on their own maybe with an occasional shiur here and there uh but they're not devoted to the uh, torah to, to to such an extent um many times you'll find that they're comfort in their knowledge and uh, their confidence in their abilities is actually superior uh, to the comfort and the, and, 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 the, uh, uh, and, and the confidence that extraordinary Torah scholars have. And it's not because the Torah scholars are self-conscious, but rather because the Torah scholars are uh, much more knowledgeable about what's at stake, uh, how much information is there, uh, the details that many of them, the vast majority of, uh, of society doesn't even know exist, needless to say, understand them or, or knows what to do with them. So there's, uh, the Torah is endless. When we say the Torah is endless, it it's literally means it's endless. Uh, but uh, until you delve into it, it's impossible to understand just how endless it is. Uh, but the way that a person can access this uh, and at least get on that path is by dedicating themselves to learning Torah each day, following what Torah says, but also having a, uh, a rabbi and having a da Torah that they're submissive to, that they're submissive to. And it can't be, you know, like a uh, multiple choice. You know, I'm going to ask three rabbis and whoever gives me the, the answer that I like, I'll submit to him. No, that's not being submissive. That's actually the opposite. So it's important to, uh, to, to do that. Can one carry a Megillah on Shabbat this week? Uh, no, bring it uh, after Shabbat. Bring it after Shabbat, bring it before Shabbat. Um, the women taking care of babies obligated to fast. If the woman is uh, breastfeeding or she gave birth within the last uh, uh, within the last two years, she doesn't have to fast tomorrow. It's so much to learn, it will take us many lives. Exactly. Yes, you're right. And even many lives will not be enough. That's why we have 
you know, to learn as much as we can in this life. In order to earn our place in an eternal good, which is a place where we could learn Torah for eternity. Bezot Hashem. It never ends. That's also why in the beginning of the day, we say the blessings, morning blessings. Part of the morning blessings is also the blessings of the Torah. But before we go to sleep, there's no blessing on the Torah. There's no blessing on the Torah. You do the Shema Yisrael, you do Birkat Mapil, but there's no blessing of, you know, finishing studying Torah. Why? Because Torah study never finishes. It never finishes. It's something that we're obligated to do, and Bezrat Hashem will utilize these next few days to study more Torah, to connect to Hashem, and to make sure that we do as much as we can to help those that are less fortunate than us, less fortunate to us in money, less fortunate than us in Torah knowledge, less fortunate than us, and, and actually help be a helper, be a giver, be somebody that is, uh, you know, is, is a, a contributor to the community. And Bezat Hashem, whatever you contribute, you can be sure that you will benefit out of it much more than anybody else will, including the recipient. Thank you very much for learning with me. Again, anyone that wants to donate and fulfill the mitzvot of Purim, uh, go to bhpurim.org. Or if you want to uh, sponsor any of the lectures for next week, uh, you can go to the uh, Be'ezrat Hashem uh, website, uh, Be'ezrat Hashem.org. Or if you want to uh, order, also there's still some boxes left of the new book. Uh, it's in English and Hebrew. You can go to bhkiruv.org. Uh, get yourself a box of 20 books for free. Uh, to give for free uh, in your community uh, and uh, not to sell. Like, unfortunately, some people are selling some of the merchandise we gave them for free. Uh, this is not allowed. Uh, we gave it to you to distribute to people, not to sell it. But unfortunately, some people are so money hungry that uh, they can't help themselves. So we gave them something for free and they're selling it as if you know, they're allowed to sell it. Uh, but what can you do? HaKadosh Baruch runs the world. Uh, thank you very much for learning with me, Mesh, and bless each and every single one of you and all of Am Yisrael to have a successful Torah lessons, Torah lectures, uh, and uh, elevation in the Torah. Have Shabbat Shalom, Purim Sameach, and make sure to always remember to be holy. School of Mitzvot. Holkanos asked him, what can we do to protect ourselves from Chavrei Mashiach? He says, Torah and Gminut Chasadim. Even if somebody does a, a nice thing or learns a lot or anything like that, it's never compared to bringing one of Hashem's lost kids that's been lost for the last 3,000 years back home. One of the beautiful things that we have in our organization is that we have both Torah and Zikui Rabin because we have our Kolels, we have our Avrachim, and we also have our Kiruv that we do around the world. Our lectures reach every corner of the world, Baruch Hashem, in multiple languages, but of course, we always want to do even more. כל זה שעכשיו אנחנו נשמע את השופעה של המשיח. נמצא איתנו כאן האורח מפלורידה, יושב ראש הארגון, מזכה הרבים, הרב ירון ראובן. בעזרת השם כולנו נעשה ונצליח ונגדל בתורה ונזכה את הרבים ונעשה כבוד שמיים כמו שצריך. עבדתם המלאי התורה, תמשיכו, תהיו אור גדול. למען ישראל, אדוני אלוהים, אדוני... בהזדמנות אני מברך את הרב ירון רובן שהוא זקן את הרבים ומחזיק תורה בעם ישראל בארץ וגם בתפוצות אשרי אמר שלך לקרוא שימשיך עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה זכות גדולה מאוד שהוא מחזיק תורה בעם ישראל טוב שסים נוספו הערב לעם ישראל לכבודה של תורה להרמת קרנה של תורה וכל הדברים הללו ברוך השם הודות לידידנו 
יושב-ראש הארגון שעוד לא ידע את ההפתעה שתכננתי לו. While we have Kiruv work that we've done throughout the whole year, we also have the Torah that we're constantly producing more and more of, and last but not least, the uh, Chesed to feed the poor people in Israel. A very special thank you to all our amazing guests who show real Avat Yisrael by taking the time out of their busy schedule and sharing their ups and downs with us, all for the sake of Avat Yisrael. <laughs> One of the big things that we have, aside from this campaign, you probably see this post or something similar to it, is also we published some of the recent results that we have, or at least up to now, of the organization. And one of the reasons why we do this each year is because we want to make sure that our partners, our donors, our Talmidim, know where their money is going. Unlike everybody else that, you know, uh, says a lot, does a lot, we want to show you what these results are. I can tell you from my experience and a little bit of knowledge about the whole Torah world, I don't know of anybody else, uh, any other organization on planet Earth that produces dollar for dollar what we've produced over these last few years. This is nothing to be arrogant about. It's simply Siyat Bishmai HaKadosh who helped us. We made every sacrifice that we can possibly make in order to, to make it happen. Producing nearly 300 films, publishing 32 books, our own books, giving out 154,000 books for free. Giving out 154,000 books is not a cheap endeavor. Anyone that wants to do such a thing has to be completely committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to his children, and most importantly, to have bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah. We also have fed over 160,000 people over these last several years. Each year during Pesach, the high holidays, throughout the year, we help a lot of people eat, help make sure that they have groceries, food, all types of things. And uh, you guys have seen many of the videos that are uh, that we've produced over the years to actually show you the people that are getting this food. You have here 160,000 people have eaten, nearly 300 Torah films. And then on top of all of it, we have 1.4 million USB CDs and cards that have been giving out for free. All of the work that we've done over the last 10 years on these USBs given out for free. Last but not least, 12,000 video and audio lectures available online in about 14 different languages for the world to watch for free. ארגון בעזרת השם לקח על עצמו את אחת המטרות הקשות ביותר בדור שלנו לתקן עולם במלכות שדי לא להסתפק במשהו אחד לעזור רק לאנשים מסכנים רק לאנשים ניצולי שואה רק לאנשים שלא מכירים את אלוקים רק לאנשים שאין להם כלום בבית אלא לעזור לכלל ישראל בכל מכל ברוך השם, חפץ השם בידינו הצליח למעלה ממיליון יהודים ויהודיות נעזרו על ידי ארגונים בעזרת השם. רק תדמיינו לכם איזה עוצמה היה לכל אחד ואחת מהשותפים שזכו להיות כל אחד כפי כוחו ויכולתו, לאיזה תוצאות הצליחו להגיע ולאיזה תוצאות עוד יצליחו. ברפור הוא שמח על לראות את השלטים, נעלה עכשיו למעלה, כמו הקצת האש, את הלימוד. ברוכים הבאים, אפשר לראות כאן. כולם יושבים לומדים, איזה רעש של תורה, איזה רעש, איזה רעש, והנה יש פה עוד בית מדרש, וגם פה יש, השם הכל עמוס. הדמיון הזה הוא לא דמיון כל כך רחוק, כי כמו שהתורה אומרת, בפיך ובלבבך לעשותו, ככה גם בדבר הזה. כל מי שירצה, כל מי שרוצה או רוצה להיות שותפים איתנו, עם הארגון הקדוש והנפלא הזה, שכל כוונתו לשם שמיים, להגדיל תורה ולהאדירה, להרים קרן התורה, לעזור לכל אחד ואחד מעם ישראל, בכל העניינים. כל המישורים, מהילד הכי קטן שצריך מטרנה וטיטולים עד האיש הכי 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 מבוגר שלעולם לא הניח תפילין ורגע לפני המוות דואגים להניח לו תפילין. אם גם אתם רוצים להיות שותפים בכאלה דברים גדולים בעשייה של תורה ועבודה וגמילות חסדים, ברוך השם, ארגון בעזרת השם כאן, לצדכם, לשירותכם, יחד עם כלל ישראל. כמעט מיליון וחצי דיסקים, דיסקונקים שחילקנו, כל הדברים האלה בחינם, יותר מ-12,000 שיעורים, אז כל הדברים האלה, מתי שבן אדם רואה כמה ההשקעה שלו, אם זה בבתים, מניות, בכל מיני דברים, והוא רואה שהמניה 
עלתה 10% במקום אחד ו-1,000% במקום שני, אז הוא מבין איפה להשקיע פעם הבאה. ואותו דבר פה, יש הרבה אנשים שברוך השם צופים את השיעורים שלנו, שיעורים של הרב אפרים, שיעורים של הרב שרביט ושאר הרבנים והארגון, ועכשיו זה הזמן להיות שותפים בדבר הגדול שאנחנו עושים ברוך השם. is because we want to show everyone what we've done to give you an indication, an indication of what we can do in the future. So this is the time where we need as much of your help as possible to push yourself more than you typically do. If you typically donate a couple hundred dollars, donate a thousand. If you, uh, if you can afford uh, the uh, uh, 8,000, 15,000, 50,000, whatever you can afford, this is the time to do it because this is going to be the help that we have to help all of these Avachim, to feed these people and perhaps Bezat Hashem one day to get that building that we've been uh, wanting to, uh, to build here in, uh, in the United States to build a community. But the, all of these things require millions of dollars. If not now, then when? <laughs> 